point. Mark? I think in life, I, I don't think you consciously choose things. I think that you're at some point that you're a conduit and some things move through you and utilize you, right, as a vehicle at times. And I think skateboarding chose me and it saved my life. I just didn't really fit in anywhere, you know? And when I went to the skate park and I saw people flying around, I literally saw people flying out of bowls. That was it, I, that was, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly. And so when I started skating, it was like I, I found a home of misfits. When the video came out and you're actually able to watch it, it really brought a whole new light to how people could connect with the sport. It really showed our personalities as well and how we work together as a team. To show that we're just having a good time, we're just doing our thing, uh, we're on top of our game. You know, and these guys are just normal dudes. And you know, that love skateboarding. Being part of the Bones Brigade and seeing, you know, guys like my heroes, Alan Gelfin, invent the Ollie. I mean, that was, you know, wow, you know, that's a legacy for him. And then Cavalero doing the Cavalerial. I'm like, wow, that's great, you know? What am I gonna do? What am I known for? I loved seeing these guys succeed. They were, they were so talented. You're talking about kids that are 15, 16 years old, and they're already world-class athletes. The things they were doing, many of the tricks belonged to them. They invented them. We rode for Stacy. We wanted to ride for a professional skateboarder that had done it and knew what to do and was creating something new. And I think most skateboarders trust a skateboarder. We were able to change everything about our world that we love together. Don't let anything poison your individuality. Be away, break away, and look in, not outward. That's me. I am what I am through what I do in a way that's unique. And that's what skating has always been to me. That's good. All that Let's stuff. Let's see full wide. Is that full wide? Yeah, Josh. Anything you want. Yeah. See, if it was like that or something, if it was great, if it was great. Do yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Really? Um, yeah. Two yeah. Houses. Uh, so take, take three, Mark. Okay. Well, let's talk about Tony. Tony was a. I mean, he was as fierce a competitive predator, an absolute total assassin that I've ever seen in the sport. He came to contest to win. What was going on with him? I think once he started winning, then, then that, I mean, well, A, you know, once you get there, it's, it's never probably quite what, what, you, what you think it's going to be. So I think once he got there, it was like, okay, I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning, and I see the flip side of this. And he probably wanted, I mean, like all of us, we want it when we don't have it. And then when we get it, I think then he was like, I just want to progress. Both Tony and Rodney get so much pleasure out of creating stuff. When you skate with Tony, you really see how smart he is. When I see him skate, I don't 
I don't go, oh, he's a natural skater. Like you see Gon skate, he, he'll even say like, I don't even know what I'm doing half the time. I'm so, you know, so spontaneous. Where Tony, you can see it and Rodney, they both break stuff down and they love kind of turning it into a math equation where like, I got to figure, like Tony will do something, he'll try a trick, do it, be off. And then every time you see a little adjustment until he gets it, which I, I, I don't see that with most skaters. You either kind of just go and it's a Hail Mary. Tony and Rodney both, I believe we're, we're two of the most innovative skaters ever. He'll slam on his hip and he'll just keep going, going, going. For nothing, no one's filming, no one's anything. The brigade to me was, I, I mean, people consider it a little safer. You almost need somebody who didn't like the brigade. I'm Josh. That's nice. Hold it, please. No, we need to tell the So 30 seconds of silence, please. This is room tone. And you're given a slate too, are you, uh, Caleb? CT, take one. Yeah. That's what I mean. Great, perfect. That's a lot of history back there. Okay. You know what <laughs> there was another thing. So Audrey, you know, Kevin Harris's wife, mm -hmm. at one of the contests, she found a piece of paper that Rodney had thrown away right before his run. Mm -hmm. So she opened it, and it was all this formula stuff, weird, weird equation type stuff. Did you hear about this? Okay, so. Do you want to get that on camera, Stacy? Does it relate to his run? Yeah. Tell Sam. Okay, yeah, well, I'm, I'm gonna ask you about that. Yeah. So you can tell yeah. it on camera. I'm okay. Sam, by the oh, way, hi, Sam, Sam George. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Lynn. Yeah, no, I'm an old friend of Stacy's. And, uh, okay. You were telling us this story. When Rodney Mullen competed in contests, a lot of times, you know, we would all be practicing off to the side, getting ready for our run but Rodney would kind of be off on his own. There was one contest where Kevin Harris's wife, Audrey, saw Rodney sitting off to the side, and then he threw something away, and then he went off to compete in his run. And of course, he did his run, and he won the contest. But she opened up this piece of paper, and it had some sort of uh, equation or something on it, something really absurd, because she thought it would be more like, okay, you know, I'm gonna do a finger flip, handstand, 540 shove it, you know, you know, showing his run, maybe like some components from his, his run he was about to do. But it had nothing to do with that. So, so Audrey looked at it and she shared it with Kevin and everything, look at this. And no one knew what it was. So she took it to this university when she got home back in Canada. And even the professors didn't know what it was. It was like some complex equation. So they took it to someone else. And the guy looked at it and it was like a chemist or something. And they analyzed it. And they said, well, this is the uh, chemical equation for aspirin, I think it was. And it was like this gigantic breakdown, super complex you know, algorithm about <laughs> the, the chemical breakdown of aspirin. And then you have to think about that. Why would someone write down the chemical equation for aspirin just before they go out and skate you know, in a pro competition and end up winning the run? And, and we would talk about that. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he wanted to clear his mind and get it completely away from skateboarding, take all the stress away, and maybe focus on something else that would just clear his mind, and then he goes out and he's free, and he's able to do his routine and just pull it off cleanly. That's the kind of guy Rodney was. You could just see the, the evolution take place. Sam George is here, and he goes, what, Jim Fitzpatrick? He goes, I know that name. And I go, to Peg. He goes, yes. Yes. He probably knows what boards you were writing every every season. What was the mood like? Do you remember what it was like when the mood was? I it wasn't any Exactly. I have never heard that. That's amazing. Wow. Take three, take one. Mark. You did a Europe tour with Oh them. my god, I mean Europe was nuts. How were the Europeans accepting this lifestyle, this California? infringed you know this was a, this was a different deal it wasn't surfing it wasn't bicycling it was skateboarding the shop owner in zurich had a 57 chevy convertible that he drove around through the streets of downtown zurich past the big banks with two surfboards sticking out the back seat mm -hmm. he had never surfed but this was part of the image of the california lifestyle i mean you know this is 1988 um <laughs> He had the Beach Boys blaring on the radio, waving at people. He was like a one-man parade. He put together a demo. There were 8,000 people in this small arena. Uh, it had a costume contest. There was a bikini contest, a, a BMX demo, 
and the Bones Brigade. And my initial reaction was, what the, what? what? That's not what we, no, we don't do that. We're not part of some spectacle. Mm -hmm. And I can remember Stevie saying, well, yeah, let's see. Let's see what he's got. So we get there, we pull up in the back, we come in the back entrance to the stadium, and you can just feel this. I mean, it was like a rock concert. The announcer was one of those, and now, from... United States, the Bones Brigade! And spotlights and spectacle. And I looked at them and, you know, it was just, it's like I was apologizing to them in advance. I'm sorry this is happening. I mean, this was so far removed from skateboarding. And Steve's like, yeah! He just got totally into it. And he drops in, he does a big backside air, and McGill the same thing. And McGill was always phenomenal in those things because he could stretch it out. I mean, 8,000 kids, they were just going nuts. And he drops in and pulls this beautiful 540. And it's just total bedlam, just total bedlam. But at that time in the late 80s, mm -hmm. all European skateboarders were looking to the United States. And they were certainly looking at the Bones Brigade skaters. Those were, that was the bar. That's where you had to go. The characters of the Bones Brigade would then perform in front of the camera and, and do things like searching for Animal Chin. So I came, that was my entry, was right at the end of the impact of Animal Chin. Yeah, so I think the skateboarding culture was, you know, a language that he could relate to. Great, yeah. perfect. That's yeah. what I need to know. Yeah. Great. And then he saw Van Hammerstroll's poster of, right. of Jimi Hendrix. And got him to drop the camera. And then he dropped in uh, Andre the Giant's face and the rest is history. All right. So I'm going to go start this. I'm going to do the 40th anniversary um, concert for Bangladesh poster. and, and uh, For Danny? Yeah, yeah. He's a, a super cool guy. Super cool guy. And a good skater, too. You guys up, Pat? Yeah. Okay. There is both a connection with skateboarding and punk, and there's a skate, uh, connection with skateboarding and art. When I started skateboarding, skateboarding went hand in hand with punk. and. What seems logical to me is that the aggressive nature of skateboarding and the aggressive nature of punk rock went together in a visceral sense. In an intellectual sense, punk was very much about challenging authority, and so was skateboarding. So it was a natural connection. Punk culture and skateboard culture had always been about creating eye-catching graphics, provocative graphics, whether it was album packages for punk or the bottoms of boards or t-shirt designs. There was always this, uh, this sort of do-it-yourself, make stencils, make stickers, mark your skate turf um, mentality in skateboarding that to me as an artist, though it may not have been cool, it was an outlet for me. Future Primitive came out. I really loved that title. It was something that was, that was both, uh, you know, very physical and very primal, but also, um, evolved. What do you mean evolved? Evolved in that it didn't say, it, it, it said anything's possible. We're gonna, we're gonna create our own future by, you know, making up things that nobody's ever done before and progressing by using, using the city, the city landscape as, as a playground. You don't have to make a football field or a basketball court. You've got your, your playground right there in the city. And later on, of course, with public domain, I think that message was being, was being pushed. Uh, I always felt that my parents hated skateboarding, and any time there was a glimmer of something conceptual or thoughtful in it, I would point it out to my parents and say, I think, you know, these, these people are on the ball. Look at this stuff, you know. Ban this, future primitive, public domain. These, these are concepts. <laughs> <laughs> what was their reaction? My dad said, uh, son, you should be a lawyer. You're just trying to justify being a hoodlum. It's really hard to make it as an artist, but if you do something within skateboarding, which is a tough industry also to, to make a living in, um, as an artist, I think you know, you, the work ethic, the ethos of it is gonna carry you really far. And also, skateboarders, they are critical, they're harsh. You, you, know, you might, you might uh, go into art class at art school and people sort of tiptoe around the weaknesses of your stuff, Skateboarders, they won't hold back. They're just like, that sucks, that's bullshit, that's whack, you know? You're, uh, you've got to be on your game to be a good artist in skateboarding. Shepard, I so appreciate this. Oh, yeah. Thing. God, no you're so good, man. <laughs> Seriously, I do this. I, I've interviewed thousands of people, man, and you made my job so easy today. <laughs> cool. Seriously. Cool. Well, seriously, it's a big honor to be, to be part of it. I, um, you know, 
it was life changing for me, um, skateboarding. So you know, and and you know your contribution, the whole Bones Brigade contribution, huge for me. Go on three, one, two, three. Yeah. So if I take it one quick time. Thank you. Okay. Great. <coughs> Pat, you ready? Yeah. Josh. Ready, ready. Good. Three, six, take one. Yeah. Ronnie, have you, you've done quite a bit of interviewing and stuff, haven't you? Yeah, right? So how did you do this? Skateboarding? Yeah, yeah. Did you flip your board into you? Um, no. I whipped out and just fell straight to the bottom just on a little transition. And, uh, and it was my first injury where I was supposed to quit skating. And my dad, that was the deal. The first time I got hurt, the first time I would have to quit. And and Wait, so you did it back then. Yeah, I had just started Wait skating. A second. I did it on a Cavalier. Wait a minute, you had a broken tooth. I didn't even know this. I was riding you had a fake going tooth when wings. I put you on the team. No, it it shattered, and um, this one's gonna break out too. But it shattered both of them. But it shattered and stayed in. And so just two years ago, I bit into a sandwich and it broke off, and I just started laughing. I called my wife, and I was like, "Honey." I got a lisp because <laughs> when it first comes out, you can't talk, right? And and I thought, you know, this. I went for eight months um, toothless, and I hated the freaking horseshoe they put in your mouth, you know. So I'd never wear it, and I got to like it. It's just in terms of character, and I thought, you know, this was, this was the injury that was supposed to take me out of skating, and never had a tattoo, although kind of want, wanted one, but thought, nah, not me. But when that came out, I thought, you know what, that's natural. And it was, it preserved the, I always think of that Cat Stevens drunken guillotine. That lyric, just hanging over your head, you don't know when it's coming down. And I thought, that's what it was like with my dad. I'm gonna preserve it. So when I, when I was like, what do you think about a stainless steel tooth, you know? Can't really rock a goal. And, and uh, so Doc helped me out. Unbelievable. Yeah, so it makes me smile when I look at myself. <laughs> I remember that. Okay. They don't realize that there was a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of history behind it. So we have a lot of ground to cover. Well, I think, and also, you know, you have to understand too, is like before I'm part of the story, I'm a fan. Let's move a little bit. Just a foot, maybe. Keep going now. One night I'm at my, my aunt's house and the phone rings and it's you calling my aunt. And we have still to this day, no one knows how you got that number. <laughs> you know, they still talk about it. But remember when Stacy Peralta called? <laughs> you know? And uh, hey man, Stacy, uh, we want you to come out of this contest in Oceanside, man. I was like, I can't. You know, I'm, I'm in summer school. Let me, let me talk to your mom. I put my mom on the phone and I don't know what you said to her, but she's letting her baby get on a plane by himself and go to California for this contest. And now I'm flying out like on a Friday and flying back on a Sunday night. It's like intense, you know? I don't know shit, man. I get on the plane and the plane starts to take off and the little air vent thing that's for air conditioning, I think I'm supposed to, that's my oxygen. I'm like, you know, like, fuck, I don't know shit, man. Like, you know, like. I, somehow I also carried a, a duffel bag onto the plane and held it between my legs. It was this tall. I couldn't bring my table down to, to eat or anything. And no one said you can't do that. Like I just sat there on the, like, like the fucking duffel bag like this. And then I'm like fuck, trying to suck air. I'm just like, I get there and I sit for like two hours and I'm just shitting myself. I don't, you know. And uh, finally Mike McGill walks up. He's like, Falel, come on. You know, it's like. He already had a nickname for I've never even met the guy. He has a nickname for me, you know? So uh, I show up down at uh, the contest. I don't, know, I don't know what came over me, but I just, it was like my time to shine. It was just like, skate. I've got cement. I've got wheels. This is where I'm comfortable. I don't, really don't think I skated it good enough to win the contest, but I think it was just, it was a moment in time where everything was changing, and I, I represented the change. And... So because of that, like I, I won. People got caught up in the moment, and the excitement of the moment, said he's the winner, which I think is actually the more righteous, <laughs> righteous way, but I got a huge trophy. I got this duffel bag. A weekend spent, my roommate was Jesse Martinez. <laughs> you know, it was, 
it was an exp it was a full experience, man. But how, how does that relate to like? No, it's fantastic. I, I just gotta. I, I, you're knocking me out, dude. This is the most nervous I've ever been for an interview. You I've have done. I've done. You were calling. Can you imagine how many interviews I've done? It's the only one that matters. You never do it though, right? You gave me the stuff. Yeah. No, I would. I would not. I'd be fast. <laughs> Mark? What was it about rolling on a board? Like, why didn't you choose surfing? Why didn't you choose bicycle motocross? What was it? Um, Did something happen? Was there a moment? When I first started skating, it was just in my neighborhood uh, with friends. My older brother gave me his old board because um, he was a surfer and he skated a little bit. And when I went to the skate park, which was relatively close to my house, when I went there and I saw people flying around, I literally saw people flying out of bowls. That was it. I, that was, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly. Nothing was established. It was just this empty canvas. You know, everyone was trying to figure out what can we do with this. What do you mean by that? Skating had come from this sort of fad. You know, obviously people were trying to emulate surfing originally, but it was all about freestyles. I mean, the, the most often asked question you got if you told people you skated then was how many 360s can you do? I knew that there was this movement of people skating empty swimming pools. You know, you just knew about it. You'd see it in magazines and things. And so the skate parks all emulated empty swimming pools. And so when I finally went and saw it live and realized the potential of flying out of these bowls, um, that's when I was hooked. And then I, I didn't care how many 360s I could do after that. I love the, uh, I, I love the daredevil aspect of it. I love that, that you could go and, and you know, test human limits. And also the fact that, that there was nothing established in this world. There wasn't a set way of doing things. There wasn't this, this um, there wasn't like a prerequisite of what you have to learn before getting to the next level. It was just like, hey, we're, we're skating pools. We're trying to figure out what we can do with it, you know? Grinding and, and hitting the lip and, and aerials and hand plants. It was all like, whatever you come up with is yours. I was gonna keep doing it and doing the next thing and get better. And um, I knew that of myself at the time, but I didn't think it, was significant. I didn't think it mattered in the world of skating, and he did. When Stacy came down to shoot me for the very first video, took me out to lunch and said, you know, you, you really have the potential to, to win everything. And I, I was, you know, he said I just stood there in silence, and it wasn't because, it wasn't because I was, I was doubting him or I was freaked out, I was more just overwhelmed with the sense that that's what he expects of me now. And so we trusted him implicitly. We trusted him to do the ads and to do the videos. And we knew the end product was going to be amazing. I heard him. Ah, awesome. oh, 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 no, he just got DD, but he's normally green. Do you think he has it? I don't think it does. Try that shirt. I'm just here to add a little color. You have, you have, it is such a beautiful <laughs> shot, man. We are camera speeding. Cool. Scene nine, take one. Mark. You mentioned out there dream come true. What did you mean by that? Ah, a dream come true. Well, as a kid, like when I first started skateboarding, like immediately I looked up to the Bones Brigade. That was it. Like I had a goal in life and it was to ride for Powell. <clears throat> this is something I asked Tony. Why was this team a goal when Eddie Alguera was not on it, the Alba brothers weren't on it, Alva, Bowman, no big names were on this team. So what possibly could have attracted you to getting wanting on this Steve team? Steve Caballero. Mike McGill, Teddy Bennett, Scott Foss, my favorite skater, David Z, Jay Smith, Jamie Godfrey. Like, those are the dudes that I looked up to as a kid. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I liked all the other guys, but I wanted to be associated with the Bones Brigade. Like, that is what I wanted. But what was it about those guys that was- Because they, because you picked the most elite, raddest dudes, and that was, that was known, and you were like this rad coach that would be around him and like, help him with contests and stuff, and it was like, you were the only dude out there doing that as far as I could see. And I wanted to be a part of that. Let me get one, two, three. Go for a good luck, one more. One, two, three. That's awesome. Hey, man. Good to see you. How are you, man? Good, really good. Oh, well, this is actually... Take three. Mark. 
Can I just tell one quick sidebar story? Absolutely. <clears throat> you were, you were, you know, we were talking about sort of the, the death of skateboarding and 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 skateboarder magazine ending and action now starting. And you know, like I said, we had cover stories about can it survive and this and that. Everybody knew what the, what a struggle it was. Well, like ten years later, I met I met my buddy's rehearsal dinner. He's marrying this gal from Utah, and we have a rehearsal dinner up in Malibu. And her sister is married to some guy I don't, I've obviously never met. But it's getting on in the rehearsal dinner, everybody's drinking a lot of wine, and I'm kind of keeping to myself. And so this guy is like starting to get drunk. And he's like, wait a minute, are you D. David? D. David from Action Now? And I'm like, yeah. And he like, almost got out of his chair. He's like, you kill the sport, man! You ruined skateboarding, man! And he was like, like literally people had to hold him back. And I was just like, dude, it's like 15 years ago, man. Come on, are you serious? He was so pissed at me. He was like just ready to kill me because I shattered this snow globe that he had been in for most of his life. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. We're talking about a passionate thing here. Skateboarding is passionate. People involved in skateboarding were very passionate. All of us were. We all put our, our own thumbprint and footprint on it. We all had our own little personality signature somewhere in it. That was what made the sport so amazing. That's what made it so interesting. I mean, for you to have all these guys on your team and they were making, what, I don't know, a dollar a board, two bucks a board, I don't know, but they all had their own graphic. They all had, they were like rock stars. The whole industry were just pumping personalities. The whole thing was just persona and image and all of this stuff. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was like half rock star music and half Super Bowl of sports. I mean, these guys were so idolized, and, and all, the, all the amateurs wanted to be pros so badly, and the pros were treated like gods. Everywhere they went, there were groupies and signatures, and I mean, it was this, this crazy lifestyle, these crazy checks in the mail, and it was, it was like the most absurd thing ever, like only in America, right? But it, but it was fantastic. Got lunch, and I worked out all the days I worked out, man. How much I Speed on A. You get that? Yeah, I got it. Seat 11, take one. Mark. In the 80s, this, the term skate and destroy and the rebirth of the urban came back. Yes. And I want to know if you could, what, what your thoughts are on that, if you can talk about that. Yeah, because it was that whole skateboarding as a crime thing, too. You know, we realized that we were on the edge of society's fringe, you know, and then in order to really be skateboarders, we had to constantly be on the alert, whether it be in a backyard, pool, in a drainage ditch, even skating on the street. You know, it was considered an illegal and obnoxious activity. And then here's this punk rock turning new wave kind of image. We were basically outcasts, society's outcasts. And um, to be a skateboarder was wearing like a badge of rebellion, you know. So a lot of us had to live it. And, and that's what we did, you know. And that's, that's why punk rock music was so synonymous with skateboarding at the time. That's why a lot of guys started their own bands. That's why, you know, everybody went back underground. Stuff. Why, do, why does skateboarding and punk rock fit? What is the fit? Anarchistic attitude and rebelliousness and just defiance to authority. I mean, what does, like, a guy like Dwayne Peters and Johnny Rotten have in common? It's obvious. Besides the, just the rugged craziness of just their, you know, the way that they look. It's, it's not just that outer appearance, it's that inner angst and that attitude. All good. Scene 12, take one. <clears throat> did, you, did your parents have any issues with you skateboarding? Um, no, I mean, they were supportive. But I mean, for me, it was interesting because, you know, a lot of the opposition I got were from other brothers and sisters, like other black people that I hung, you know, were with at school and things because it was so tied to surfing in a white sport that if you're black skateboarding, then they're just like, why are you trying to be white? You know, so for me, it was more opposition um, in that realm. You know, and I had friends growing up that were black that skated really good, and they were huge inspirations to me. Wait a minute, talk more about that. I, I never, I didn't know that. Can you, can you share more about that? Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't even care. I mean, my attitude was just like, I love doing this. Like, I hope you enjoy what you're doing. Like, the fact that you don't get it doesn't bother me at all. 
I think that's what's neat about skateboarding too. There is this kind of selfishness, like unless you do it, you don't get it. And there's something about that that I've always dug, you know. I didn't feel like I ever had to explain it to anybody or anything, you know. So when that came, when, you know, when they were saying those kind of things, like, you know, you know, why are you trying to skateboard? Why are you trying to be white and things like that? For me, it was just like, you don't get it, you know. And it, it really helped motivate me, and it kind of validated that what I was doing was something that had effect, <laughs> you know, not only on me, but I guess can affect other people, you know. Scene 14, take one, Mark. Hello, my name's Alan Ali Gelfand. I'm famous for inventing the no-handed aerial, also called the Ali Air. Where does the name, what is, how does Ali fit into this? I ate lots of hamburgers at a place called Lums, and the name of the hamburger there was an Ali Burger. And the guy who owned Lums, his name was Ali. Basically, my friends called me Ali, and then I started doing this trick where I would pop off the board off the air and land on top of the lip, or I'd pop it and land on top of the wall. Back then, it was no big deal, it was just an ollie. And the trick really wasn't even like, oh, he's doing an ollie, that's just ollie doing his thing. You ready, guys? <coughs> that's okay. 15, take one, even Mark. Vibrate. I mean, skateboarders are artists. I mean, it's like we said, it's an individualistic art form that happens to be athletic. You know, we've discussed and other people have how skateboarding is something that you could do on your own. I mean, an artist does his work on his own generally, you know, in a room by himself and puts something to paper, makes a film, takes a photograph. It's something that's very intensely yours. You know, skateboarding gave a lot of kids that sense of self that they could do this. I mean, skateboarding inspired me to do what I do. I've built my whole life because of skateboarding. Skateboarding is where I cut my teeth taking pictures, but it was something that I I got confidence from being a skateboarder. I loved giving myself the thrill of skateboarding. I loved so much what was going on in skateboarding that I wanted to take pictures and show in the way I saw it. But I wanted to separate myself from the others. It was my unique perspective and I had to do it in a way, I'm looking at the magazines and I'm saying this, this doesn't look right. I learned to compose pictures. I learned how to tell a story in a way with personality, with character. It's because I was a skateboarder. It's, it's from everything. I mean, that's my story. And I know that, you know, Shepard Ferry and all these other great artists that, I mean, skateboarding is, runs through our veins. It's not all that we do, but it's in our veins and it, and it contributes to our lives every day. Mm -hmm. Glenn, that was phenomenal, man. I'm so glad you have your contribution to this. Okay. I really am. I really and Someone really... had to say something about Adam and Chip. Oh, no, that is... <laughs> Fantastic. And the fact that you come back and say you like public domain, it's like, oh, wow. You have the calm tech on. I'm just like, going, oh, this is brilliant. We're talking about Glenn Freeman. <laughs> no, he was great. You guys didn't get the phone call, but Craig and I both did. Yeah, the stripes. No, oh, oh, my God. Where'd you wake up this morning? I can't answer that. <laughs> there you go. I'll be right back. Don't start with Yeah. Why well, did come in? Oh, you got it, yeah. Josh? I got it. Well, you got all these quantifiers and these metaphors that people use in society about what success and failure is and what's you know, original and, and what's invented and what's appropriated. And, and that has really not much to do with it because you just have things that come together. There's time for certain things. There's, you know, people, you know, things coalesce, events come together. You get this assemblage of absolutely some of the weirdest people on this planet. And, and, and maybe on God's green earth, everybody's strange. I won't, I won't discount that. Everybody's an individual. But the quote unquote Bones Brigade was an odd assemblage. There's a hundred, you know, points in an equation. You got that upper one or two percent. And, uh, you know, the, you know, the one percenters as they're usually known. And those are the guys. Those are the guys who advance it. Those are the guys who are at the forefront. Those are the guys who change it. And uh, there's one percent. And then you got 99 of the rest of the percent. And, you know, that top 10 percent is pretty good. And then you got everybody in the middle where it's comfortable. And then you get the lucky guys at the back of the short bus. And those 
are perhaps the most fun. Definitely the girls you want to go out with. But, uh, and in all of that, that was out of the process of the power that that meant to be on to always be getting to write to And where do they stand as far as that? <coughs> and talk about the things that they invented. Yeah. I mean, I've been involved in, in skating since 1975, which was the real, I mean, sure, it happened in the 60s, but 74, 75 was the big push here with the, with the urethane wheel. And in my memory banks, going right back to 75, and, and in most people who go back to that time in history, every major trick that was done that was a turning point for skateboarding was done by somebody who rode for Powell Peralta on the Bones Brigade, period. So I never forget it, Del Mar was such that mecca of being a place where innovations happened. It was the place to go to watch the best skaters in the world. And it was so cool that they had that seating around the pool, you were so close to the action. So I'm a kid in 1978, Alan Galfin drops in, does the ollie. It just like stunned me. Like I was just like, I couldn't believe it, that you couldn't ride a vertical wall and not hanging onto the board. Wh what? It, you know, is he glued to his board? How does that friggin' even work? The physics of that. And then I think 84, the, the finger flip air by Tony. It's just like, are you kidding me? And then, I'll never forget it, like I'd heard, being the freestyle, you were kind of thrown over here to do the freestyle thing, and then all of us would go and watch the, the vert thing going on in the, in the pool because it was so exciting to watch and trying to get a good seat to watch what was going on. In 85, I think it was, when Mike McGill drops in, and he, he didn't pull this off until he was in the finals. He was in the top eight. And I'm sitting there this watch and not expecting nothing because I didn't hear the rumors that he was going to pull off this trick. And when he pulled off the 540, I just remember this looking at my arms and the goosebumps. <laughs> Hey, don't touch, dude. Sorry. <laughs> you can have to get out of here. You can stand look, here. Look, don't no, touch. I mean, you guys are going to get your thing No, no, no. We're, we got time. We're, we're just getting set up. Let, let you guys... It's uh, crushed rubber. Yeah, rubber tires. Yeah, like schoolyard stuff. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. glue that down. It just has a nice look on camera. Have a nice view. Wait for this. Bring it 40. Yeah. Who's the no, no, you look a little, you might be a touch dark, Pat. I can't go anymore, that's it for me. The cell phone's off, the off. Tommy, I'm going to start where I started with everybody, you know, the main guys. I, I'm going to start at the beginning, like, why <laughs> did you choose skateboarding? It chose me. I didn't choose it. How do you mean? I think in life, I, I don't think you consciously choose things. I think that you're at some points that you're a conduit and some things move through you and utilize you, right, as a vehicle at times. And I think skateboarding chose me and it saved my life. And I think that was the reason why I ended up skating because otherwise I'd probably be not here. What do you mean it saved your life? Can you talk about that? Um, how many different times? <laughs> You know, going to school, being at school, and always feeling like a loner, you know? I mean, that's what skating was for the black sheep, for the people, for the outcasts. Um, and I always felt not quite like the rest of the kids, you know? And what had happened was a, a friend had gotten a skateboard, a black knight, and he came over one day to my house, and I grew up on 17th Avenue, where all the hills were, you know, um, that are in the videos. And he brought me this skateboard, you know? I was like, wow, cool. And uh, we just, he, he gave it to me because he didn't, he wasn't into it. So he brought me this and I was hooked, you know, ever, ever since then. So I don't ever think I chose it because instantly I was, I was just um, addicted. Take one, Mark. I went to Whittier Skate Park. I was a local there, and I was one of the managers. And I skated with like Lance Mountain and No Blender, and John Lucero. And skating with those guys, they and Lester Gasai, they they made me understand that just come and have fun and skate, you know, because they were also good, 
you're sort of embarrassed to skate with guys like that back then, or I was. You know, I'd watch, and when they'd start skating, I'd sit down. And when I became their friends, they just said, you gotta just come and skate and have fun. And once I, once I broke that barrier of just having fun, that's when I really uh, got better, like substantially better. Because skating with those guys, they were some of the best there was for, you know, in the history of skating. And I just, I don't even know how I got, how I, you know, excelled that fast, to be honest, but I think it was a product of my environment. Lance was like, I thought he was sort of like an alien or something. He's like cuckoo a little bit. You know, I mean, he was so good at skating and stuff, but his personality was like a clown. Like, you know, I mean, he was not afraid to just be, you know, quirky and stuff. And, and he's always been like that personality, I think. You know, he's really sincere and passionate about what he does. He takes it so seriously, serious that he's not even serious. He's one of the, him and Neil Blender are the most odd people I've ever met. And they're so nice, you know. The whole concept that Stacy did was like, it's never been duplicated or come close to since. When I got on the Bones Brigade as a person, it really, even to this day, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had, you know, being part of that. Because all those guys were such great people. Hey, Skip. Hey. How you doing? How'd it go? Good. Okay, I think. Was it good? Yeah. yeah. Was it good? Oh, he just gave me the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, I don't know. But it motivated me. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was good. Yeah. Well, it's good. I mean, it's also, you know, we don't know. You see, half half Darren. Half Darren. We go back, don't we? Too far. <clears throat> we're talking about how it died and the reinvention of it coming back. Uh -huh. Is there any aspects of this you're particularly interested in starting with the Just hit you? Just, just go with it. All right, right, go with it. All right, let's do it. Let's get going, guys. 21, take one. Mark? Skip, let's just start there. What, you mean the whole idea that skateboarders are outsiders versus insiders? Sure, that's completely understandable. What happens is, is that, like, you have a certain paradigm in America, you know, a certain paradigm of manliness where you have to be like a football player or a baseball player or some, some, you know, the whole idea that like you're organized and herded into this activity so that you could be part of this group, you know, is just the American way. But, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, absolutely, the country would never function without groups of people going to work and doing things. And it's always interesting because like skateboarders and surfers kind of always have this like underhanded way of making fun of um, the group people in general. Right, which always tends to get them in trouble. I mean, when I was in high school, like the football players always wanted to beat us up because they thought we were mocking them, you know, and just our existence was mocking to them, you know. I mean, because how could we, you know, like be dating these girls, you know, which we shouldn't be dating because obviously we weren't like out there Friday night in the Friday night lights, mm -hmm. you know, giving blood for the school. You know, in essence, what they didn't understand is that girls wanted to be talked to. You know, and so when they were out there sweating and oozing, we were there grooving and moving. <laughs> the idea was in the 70s, the manufacturers tried to do something to appease the parents to make skateboarding palatable. Uh -huh. And then in the 80s, it was like, you know what, it's not palatable, and we're going to celebrate that. So can you talk? Well, I mean, that was the whole thing. It was these punk guys were using these things as basically everything from transportation is to weaponry. You know what I mean? It's like they're like good for going down hills and also like if you got in a beef after a show, you could like swing it on people or you know, people are giving you a bad time, you could use utilize it as a weapon or to block something from hitting you know, there's like it had like it was kind of multiple terms, sort of like a Swiss army knife on a bigger level. <laughs> what? Okay. See, the thing is, what happened is, is that once skateboarders took ownership of skateboarding, it became a whole different ball game. Skateboarders were always dependent on like companies and these big advertisers and stuff to validate their existence. And once we just told them we're validating our own existence, you know, we are who we are, and we are who what we are, and we don't care what you think, that rebellious nature you know, became an industry. Fausto and Eric Novak, George Powell, Brad Dorfman, and Larry Bama got together. And their guys actually had some, you know, money, right? And they went, look, we're gonna roll the dice on this deal. We're gonna 
abandon the idea of coastal and somewhat, and we're going to Kansas and Iowa and, and all these strange places, and we're going to ignite this thing. You know, maybe 10 people would show up, but it was like a cell that germinated. You know, that, that those 10 people went back and went like, we're, you know, like we're not alone. Sort of like early Christianity in the caves, you know what I mean? You know, instead of drying fish, we're having barbecues. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, buddy? How are you, dude? Hey, I yeah, seen you in a Ford first. Yeah, did you see that? I wanted three tons. Like, that's great right for <laughs> me. And it was that split second I knew it was yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, real great. quickly, relate. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to get a bite to eat? Stop by the shop. Okay, shop. Let's go. Where am I living? Down there, see? Let's see if shut anything. It's nice. It's real strong. Cell phones up. Yeah. Four cell phones are up. You get speed. 22, take one, Mark. The generation before us kind of did things on their own, but not to the caliber that we were doing. I mean, you remember some of the demos we did in London. We got to London, I think it was me, Lance, and Tony. There were so many people, and I think there was a big trampling or something at a soccer stadium that they turned us away and said, you know, you guys can't do this. You know, you don't have the proper security. People are gonna get hurt. As we showed up in Mexico, we showed up in Australia, wherever we showed up, there was a huge you know, amount of people that just kept increasing and increasing. We were known everywhere we went. You know, It was a, kind of a crazy lifestyle for us for a little while there. Uh, in certain countries, it was hard because the people were kind of, uh, for instance, France, we went to France. People are very friendly there, everybody knows that, until you meet French skateboarders and they all know, oh, they know them and everything was great, you know. Um, for the most part, in Japan, everything was, was wonderful. You and Stevie, when you went to Japan and you, it was right after the demo, you threw, your, you threw your hat and your shirt and a bunch of stickers out in the crowd and then they came over, all those kids, they picked up all the stickers and brought them back to you. <laughs> You know, for me to get on the phone's great after going to California with Alan and being invited to go to Stacy's house and, and uh, kind of hang out it was just, you know, I, I paid for my way out there. I remember I had $421 and that's what it was. I think my dad gave me 50 bucks. And, uh, you know, I was just so excited to go out to California and skate these parks that I seen in these magazines. I said a lot. And one, two, three. I'm going to need to do a couple of these guys. And here we go again. One, two, three. Very proud, guys. You guys have published a fucking amazing amount of stuff. That's what I want, a sense of pride. He's got 16 million of you and Rodney and me. Oh, damn, Murray, you messed up in a heartbeat now. No, 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 boy. One, two, three. Hold on, let me check it real quick. Like, like, oh, one more for good luck, guys. No, no, he's FedExed it today. One, oh, cool. two, three. Thank you. The Office. Steve Carell. Is that too bad? City of Men? Third from Sesame Street. Promotion? Promotion, sorry. Check close stuff and highlight. I was thinking the whole time. Okay, I think he's going to be yeah, but it's really about you guys coming in the 80s. That's what it really starts. Four top lines. Hey Lance, look this way. Hey Josh, give me a wider shot. What this one? Yeah, I think we're in. Can we get my more? Move right back to you. Yes. In your model. I love the one. Tell me what. Thanks for red. Let's go, boys. I'll roll it nicely. Stacy, we're ready. I think you should get your camera checked out. After you. 23, take one. Mark. Lance on Cut. Genuine. <laughs> we are pro skateboarders trying to make a living. And this opportunity came up to go to Italy to do a TV show. <laughs> it's the best story, man. It is crazy. Yeah, let's, let's do this, you know. Plus, it's, you get to see Italy. You know, all this stuff is combined. Italy, yeah, cool. The group that's going to be in the show is, it's two arrogant hacky sackers, a four-man, like two-girl, two-guy uh, roller disco team, 
and a chainsaw juggler. And Tony Hawk and I. <laughs> we go in there and it's, we're gonna have a half pipe. We're gonna do the half pipe demo and these guys are gonna juggle and they're orchestrating the whole show, but they're building the ramp for us. The day before the show, we, the ramp's finally done. We walk in, it's this weird rickety metal ramp thing with one layer of paneling on it and a two by four on the top. And it's on a stage full, full with mirrors. And we're going, great. They haul us into this dressing room. I see the costumes. And I see uh, clear blue shorts and clear yellow shorts. And I, and I grabbed the clear, yellow, clear blue, like grabbed them. The dresser is this little small gay dude, like trying to help us out. Like I'm like, I am not. Tony gets the clear yellow. The guy's trying to pull Tony's pants off. Pants off and shorts on, pants off, shorts on. Tony don't have any underwear, because you don't wear underwear. Tony's pants go on, see right through, completely like naked, just yellow clear pants on, like, oh my, it was terrible. So come out, try the ramp again. We took a couple runs, I guess. Tony bails on a backseat air or something, or, and it, he hits one of the mirrors and it breaks, and there's like, nah, show's over. Like, we're not doing this. You're not in this show. End of the story. Like, the whole ramp thing got scratched. Um, they juggled, they did the chainsaw, they did whatever, and I guess it turned into we did an interview? Because I don't even remember, you yeah, told me that I gave you this tape. I don't know anything about it, I just was like... It was the best trip ever. I'll say it. No, no, we're not going to do it. I, I, I got it. Let's do it. Wait it up. Okay. But that's okay. No, no, keep going. It's all right. I'll just kind of just just let me know. How do you deal with slams? Slamming's a, a weird thing. It's like. Uh, it's so familiar because we've been doing it for so long. Uh, it's like that thing where it, where uh, you kind of like scream like a bitch, and then um, after it's said and done, it kind of feels like like orgasmic, you know, which is weird, you know. But there's something good about slamming. You ever broken a bone? Yeah. Which one? Oh. Uh, uh, I've broken almost everything. You know, I've broken my collarbone 16 times, all my fingers, all my, uh, you know, my legs, uh, my ankles, my toes, my feet, uh, both arms, both elbows. How's your body holding up? Uh, it, it's a little rough, but uh, it's always been rough. You know, I, I don't really have anything to deal to, you know, uh, put it up against because it's, I, you know, I remember being really sore when I was 18. So, you know, I just think uh, it is what it is, you know. I, uh, I just deal with it and, and skating is is home to me. So right. it just makes me feel good. I want you to go back to the sense of home. What do you mean by that? And was that important to skateboarders, this sense of home, the sense of being together or being yeah, man, we all wanted, uh, you know, I wanted a home, someone I could trust. That's why I hated Hawk. He had a, he had a dad that, that supported him, that, that backed him up, didn't go, you know, he was driving him to the park. Every time I grind that coping, I'm grinding my dad's face because he bailed on my family. But I, I don't want to admit that. You know, I see uh, Frank Hawk at the fence. I wish I had that. I wish I had a dad fucking standing at the fence going, you know, uh, you're good, you're doing good. Anything I've learned in this life has been through skateboarding, ultimately. What is that primal thing in you that when you get on that board, what is that? The freest freest feeling 
you can ever, ever have in this third dimensional world. I've never, ever felt so free than when I'm rolling on my board. No matter how much I'm locked up, how much anything is, all the rocks that you get hit by and everything, man, I can't tell you how many times to get through all the bullshit to see my board there. And just, it's the only thing I understand. And to grab it and to be able to just jump on it is the freest I'll ever feel while I'm in this body. I know it. It gives me a sense of of me. I don't, I don't know how to describe it, and I'm so lucky that I've, I've got that. It's a hard life, and I'm so grateful to have that, and to have people to still love me back, even when I couldn't love myself. Stop it there, man. <clears throat> you ready? Yeah. Take it easy, man. Sit down. I just got to know you, man. No, you, you don't have to use this pad. We're done. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, man. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. And I, 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 it's, I want you to know, whatever it's worth to you, when I told all these guys you agreed to do this, they were so, it, it meant so much to them. You were gonna be a part of this. You know? I appreciate how honest you are, man. I appreciate how willing you are to, 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 to reveal who you are, man. You know? Thanks, Mr. Case. <clears throat> I wish I would have sponsored you. <laughs> <laughs> you would have given a good balance to the oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> shit. Are you hungry at all? You no, I'm good, Get man. You out of I'm, this I'm all good. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. From the bottom of my heart. No, man. Right, right back at so, you, man. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Good luck on well, editing you know, all you know, that. <laughs> Hey, George, how are you doing? You look great. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah. That was really awesome. A little bit of a crybaby, but you know. <laughs> thanks. Dude, come on. <laughs> All right. So I'm good? No, no, we got some. Oh, yeah, they want to get some stills with you. Okay, and hey, thanks, you guys. Thank you real quick before we do one more. Hold it. One, two, three. Hold it. That's Craig. Hold it. No, no, they come in tighter. He's the counterpoint to what it's not when you don't have somebody there. Yeah. 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 God, he has one of the most incredible reputations in the sport of anybody. Maybe the best because people love who he is and what he's willing, what he's done, what he's willing to do, and, and how fiercely honest he is. Beautiful shot because we're shooting long lens, so it's yeah, compressed wow. and everything just turns into these vivid oh, colors. Right. <laughs> Bring it back, man. Twenty six, take one, Mark. I'd say, as a kid growing up in the eighties, um, skateboarding was like a major part of what inspired me as a visual artist, as a music lover. What you part know, of skateboarding inspired you? I think our our generation is one of the last generations to like play outside, you know. And we were either playing street football or we were skateboarding. The identity part of it, I think, um, for me as an artist, I was really attracted to a lot of what was going on with the artwork. I mean, this, just looking around the set right here, it brings back a lot of memories because it, the artwork itself inspired me as an artist. Teenage identity is, is something that, um, you know, baffles the majority of adults, even though they've been there at one point in time in their lives. It's that, that spooky, 
time between childhood and adulthood where you're trying to find yourself and you need to find a voice. And it's tribal, energetic, it's sexual, it's like, <laughs> it's very dangerous. You know, I had friends who did a lot of stupid stuff. I mean, I did a lot of stupid stuff. I'm sure we all in this room <laughs> did a lot of really stupid stuff. I think for me and some of my friends, it kept us focused and grounded. Like we, we didn't do a lot of the other really stupid stuff because we wanted to get up the next day and go skate. Come back to LA the next summer might suck and everyone else had moved on. So it was kind of always very torturous for me to get, you know, to try and get good. But I seem to remember, ooh, I seem Sorry, to remember us. Uh, yeah, market. Okay, 27 point, Mark. I lived in the countryside in England and it was really rainy and it was really gravelly. And I always had this dream of putting up a, a poly tunnel and building a half pipe and that never happened. Um, so we'd go in the woods and we'd, uh, we'd build half pipes out of scrap, but they would always be wet. So we'd cover rags with petrol and then set fire to the rags and then kick the rags around the ramp to try and get the water off as much as we could and then skate these semi damp, lethal, mossy, half pipes. The first park that kind of opened up was, there was a couple metal half pipes because everything would just rot in England. And there was this big metal half pipe underneath the West Way. The word had got out that, um, that the Bones Brigade, they were coming to do a demonstration. And of course, my dad being my dad, just at some point when it was over, kind of just walked up the half pipe and was like, hey, you know, what's up? He invited them. He said, oh, if you guys are going up to Bristol, uh, which they were the next day, uh, and you've got a day off, stop at our house and have lunch on the way. You know, we'll show you around the garden and um, we can have a skate and it's something nice to do. So they said, okay. And it was a very confusing day. They kind of just did what everyone does at our house, which is kind of walk around a bit confused and sort of drink a lot of tea and have a, have a nice time with with my, with my old man. I mean, my dad was a really young hearted person, you know, and the only thing that he could possibly do to impress me as a son would be like, hey, look, who, look who's coming over, you know? He liked that they were all on tour as well, like they were on an adventure. I think he kind of, I'm sure he'd watched every skate film with me anyway, I'm sure, because there's no way he couldn't have seen from start to finish every single Bones Brigade film. I must have sat him down and watched them all. So I think he kind of liked that. They were just on an adventure, you know, or out in the world, these young guys, and they had skateboards. And that was their, they were like rock stars with skateboards, you know? There's an incredible irony here because of your father. I'm sure that he could have introduced you to any rock star in the world. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, they were the rock stars in, in my world. I'd already met everyone that was ever anyone who was musical to do with my dad. And they're all very lovely, humble people, and you don't really see it. Like, I'm not a very starstruck person. I've, I think Rodney Mullen is the only person that I haven't met that I would ever freak out if I met because of just the sheer purity of what he does. It's humbling, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it was like when I met these guys. It was like, you know, we lived, that was our alternate life in this rainy England. We lived inside you know, the Bones Brigade movies, all of your movies. Back when I was chopping up my Rodney Mullen, I thought that was I just love the mossy ramp. Oh, the mossy yeah. ramp. Yeah. 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 Just the visuals, the mossy ramp yeah. in yeah. the yeah. English yeah. forest. Danny, this is George Powell. Hi, <laughs> George. <laughs> Danny. We met, actually, Thank a very, very, very long time ago, and I have to say it's thanks beautiful. for everything you've done yeah. for everything. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you guys... It's great to have I mean, it's like, I, I don't want to smile too hard, but, you know, to see that you guys are here doing this now, it's kind of like the most awesome <laughs> that could ever happen. It makes us smile. <laughs> but thanks for all the wonderful skateboards, you know. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> and he's dressed, you can see like the pink, the tones. That's so him. heavy, but your dad, it, it, Lance looks older than your father. <laughs> I like snowboards. Just switch them out for uh, two different ones, or just... Uh... Is this, this wasn't yours, is it? Is that OG? Is that original? Is that gold? Is that from yeah, it's one of the ones. I don't know. Tony, what about that car? What about it? Is it an old, old car? Uh, no, it was, just used, it was used for another commercial, uh, so we already had it cut in half, so uh, we just graffitied it and uh, smashed the skateboard through. Nice to have a cut in half car laying around when you need one, you know? You never know when you're going to use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <that's> not <laughs>
Okay. And it's just you and Mike. Great. Just you and I talking. Yeah. Okay. All this goes away. Fantastic. Intimate, candid, love it. You want tea? You want water? Coffee? You just say so. You want to drink it? You want to stop? You want to reposition? You want to say, you know what? Let me think of that again. It's whatever you want. Oh, too good. There's no issues all right. at all. all right. That's that's fine. Yeah. Beautiful. Do it. The tray, the full 360. Is this affecting the music? I hope so. It's funny because Danny said, you know. We were having a really good time skating, Ben and I, but now we're starting to compete a little bit. And he goes, he's not getting so much fun anymore for me. <laughs> oh, Danny has one speed. Ten. That's <laughs> all the... It, it's Mach 10. Skating? Yeah. It's funny because when I skated with him at the, at the Cove, yes. I was going, holy crap, this guy's going to hurt himself. He was a maniac. He was doing these 50-50s around the pool at such radical speed. Yeah, this speed, yeah. Couldn't believe it. Man. I've been skating so nonstop for the last two years. Last year was all vert, so much so that I built a half pipe in my backyard. And I said, you know, I, I've, I've been the guy that was from the generation that disregarded street skating to a degree. And my son was having so much fun with it. And I started just growing so motivated and excited by his commitment to street and vert that I said, let me, let me just spend a couple of days doing nothing but street with my son. Mm -hmm. And it took hold. Yeah. It took hold. And now I've, for the last seven months, it's been all street. 28, take one, Mark. So just give me the background where you grew up and how you got into skateboarding? I grew up in Claremont, California, which is between LA and, um, and Joshua Tree. It's about an hour outside of LA. And um, I got into skateboarding originally uh, through the older neighbor kids who, were, who had built a ramp in their backyard and were, were throwing down pretty hard. And, and they were about five years older than, than my brothers and I and our whole crew. And that prompted us to you know, demand by hook or by crook that our parents get us skateboards. And why skate? What was it about skateboarding that got you? I mean, was there a moment? Peering over that, that brick wall, or peering through the holes in, the, in our neighbor's brick wall and watching those guys uh, charge that, that, and it was, a, it was, you can't even call it a half pipe because it was just flat plywood leaned up against the wall. Uh, but seeing them and their passion for it, it was super contagious. I was at the pipeline. I'll never forget this day. It was a cloudy day. The up, Claremont's right next to Upland. Mm -hmm. So I fortunately had, had one of the best skate parks in the world at that time. Uh, about a 10 minute car ride or a 25 minute skate. So we went there that day and it really looked, looked like it was going to just dump. And it broke through. And skaters started showing up and pretty, you know, an hour or two later, the park was pretty well full. It was a weekend, a Saturday. And in came the Bones Brigade. And the word spread throughout the park like wildfire. They're here. And we had seen Chin at that point. And, uh, and those guys just, uh, you know, just turned everybody on. Just completely changed our perspective of what, what we thought was possible. And there's, there's some great skaters from that area. Steve Alba, Chris Miller. Um, so we, we had, you know, we had a connection to that other level. Uh, and then when those guys showed up, everybody just put their boards down and those guys put on a clinic. I, I think what I was learning on an immediate level from those guys was, was uh, the athleticism, you know. I think that's one thing that still to this day, skateboarding hasn't got its just deserve uh, as far as the athleticism that it takes to do what, what these guys do at the level they do it at. Uh, I mean, within the community, of course they do, but in the outside world, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I just don't think people get it. I mean, in other words, the Bones Brigade would have a far better shot in the NBA than any starting five in the NBA would have being on the Bones Brigade. Interesting. Yeah. It was the athleticism and the ease, the ease at which they were already doing these tricks. And, and getting these airs and 
hand plants. It just, it looked like they were born to do it. Like there was, like they were chosen. Hey, thank you for all the time. Seriously. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're a part of this. Again, I'm kidding. Do you want to spend some more time with me? I'm going to look around. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, if I see some. I think this is my first time. I think this was, is this the 70s, mid-70s? Oh, yeah. 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 So gorgeous. So they just stay alone. Steve! Look at you, dude! Hey! <laughs> Two and three. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, There's no cab on this, so except this one. You right. can hold this cab. <laughs> <laughs> Two. 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 Two.
and to start from scratch and to beat the shit out of yourself. Learn how to skate. You fall down a lot and you're resilient when you're younger and you keep going, you know? I hurt myself so many times. I mean, I hit back of my head a couple times. I should have died probably. But I'll just skate in the next day, you know, a big hole in my head, just going for the same thing. And there's something so punk rock about that. And the music itself, punk rock music and the punk attitude, it's that adrenaline and that physical element that goes, seems to go so great with that sound, you know? It's like that, it's the backdrop. <laughs>
15 centimeters here now. During another sheet, you're going to I thought it looked so bad. Thanks very much. So we did another This is weird. Like I said, I feel like I'm boxing. We're giving him a little more flattering. I started gaining that when I was. Well, that was with two. That's one. Zero. Wait, there was some surface. Skateboarding. <laughs> something that we did it. <laughs> 31, take one, Mark. I got into skateboarding very early in my life, and I remember the first time I actually connected with it. I was seven years old, skating down the street in my house. There was a drugstore, Steve's Rexall Drugs, and there was a very wide sidewalk around this drugstore, and it had beautifully groomed concrete. And I remember skating for the first time on this concrete and the feeling you get, and the feeling, I, I hadn't experienced that before. When you ride a bicycle, you get to sit down on a seat, and you have handlebars to grip. There's a security factor that bicycles give you. Skateboards, there is no security. You're com it's a completely insecure act. You're standing on this moving little magic carpet. You have nothing to grasp onto. You know that if you fall, you're going to crash into concrete. And so you're going down the street, you can feel the rumble of the street, the, the street coming up in your feet. And you can feel the, 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 um, the wind at your face. And the whole time you're balancing, you're balancing, it's this way, it's that way, and you're looking for that equilibrium. You're looking for equilibrium. And so in the middle of all this chaos, as a kid, I'm feeling this sense of stillness in me. I'm going down the street on this little board with all this chaos around me, cars and people, the, the, the rumble of the street on my feet, the wind in my face, and all of a sudden I relax. I'm totally at peace, and I'm at peace right here. And so every time I get on a skateboard, I relax. It just calms me. I can't be tense on a board. And that's what attracted me to it. I was born in Gainesville, Florida in 1966. I grew up in the country on a farm with no friends, no nothing, cows and a dog. My father, he was a dentist. My mom was, I didn't know a lot of this stuff until she was dying, really. She was a prodigy and she was a pianist and she, I guess she went to college at a very early age. My mom was really gifted. My father is an amazing man. He's squadron leader, military, for the ones who dropped the bomb, the atomic bomb. He's that guy, and he has that, that way that defines him, and I see that better than... And we had an amazing home. And so I grew up with a, a strong sense of that, that you have been given everything you need and you're going to go someplace. In school, I've always been good at things and, and, and so teachers would pay attention or whatever and put me on my own, in fact. Not only are you different, you're unacceptably different. In fact, you're different along the lines of freak and failure. There are so many reasons that you will fail, because you can't deal with people, because you, it goes on. I don't, it's unclear to me, I'm a little kid. It's eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. I don't know who I am. I just know that for some reason, my dad's not stoked on me. It's like a ton of people, it's not, you know. But I definitely get the sense of, wow, there's nothing I can do that will make them happy or, or him happy. He has so much common sense, that's one thing about him. He's such a character. Uh, he always loved land and was always, he goes, if you develop a hobby, you'll end up making more money from your hobby than your profession. And indeed he did. And so it became a development. And so eventually he would develop chunks of land out in the country, maybe 20 minutes, half hour from the city. And, and so he all, we always had that property and he had 
he, he had done so well for himself and for us. Very strong man, definitely like ride up on a black horse type of thing, had fought professionally, a boxer. My father was a British citizen, total eccentric, I guess, collected military stuff. I went to a private school. I had two older sisters that were, one was very intelligent, the other one was, I'm gonna, f I'm gonna break out of this craziness and go, get, go be wild. My mom was the mom that wanted to keep everything to look right and make sure that she kept the house together but didn't really chase anything else that she wanted. So when I was growing up, I was this kid that had a half row, which was a, some crazy hair disease. Well, I started skateboarding in uh, Tampa, Florida, a little place called Newport Ritchie, Florida, with my mom and dad, uh, older brother John, and my older sister Terry. You know, we weren't rich people, but we, you know, we had everything that we needed. My, my dad and mom provided for us. Grew up in San Francisco with my brother, raised by my mom, and lived with my aunt and my uncle in um, various stages of, of our youth. My dad split or was kicked out or whatever when I was about three months old. And um, so, you know, my mom had a hard time. So, you know, she worked full time. And me and Tony were just pretty much on our own the whole time. I was walking myself to school when I was, you know, five kindergarten and um, so the thing for me you know I've, I've always been alone I've always felt you know pretty much alone um, even though you know, have my brother beat the shit out of me all the time he's like all right that'll make me feel wanted I have two older sisters an older brother my brother is closest to me he's 13 years older than me my sisters had both basically gone to college right after I was born my brother lived with us for a little while, and then once we moved to a different house, he went to college, and uh, I was an only child for the most part. I was an only child with parents that would be as old as my grandparents. I was a pretty difficult child. Like, I was very rambunctious. I was, I was rebellious in a lot of ways against my parents. I was frustrated because I wasn't as, as physical as I wanted to be. It was fun. My dad was as active as he could have been for his age. It was fun having free reign of everything, you know? I, I, I ran my parents ragged with my demands and the stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to do it, you know? I want to go to the arcade right now. Why can't you take me? Right now, right? And I was just relentless in, in my pursuit of my own pleasure, I guess. So, um, you know, I ran them ragged and, and once I found skating, I think they were just thankful that I focused my energy on something else besides torturing them. I needed constant stimulation, you know? If I wasn't skating, I needed to go to the arcade. I needed to go where there were lights and blaring noises and, and pizza and, and junk food. You know, and that's really what drove my parents crazy. They just, they didn't really have the energy or the time to provide all that to me. Um, and so once I found skating, at least some of my energies were focused. You know? I lived in um, San Jose. California on the east side. I have three older brothers and an older sister, but I don't ever really remember hanging out with them. You know, my, my oldest brother's like 11 years older than me, and the one closest to me is five. So I always kind of felt like I was an only child. And when I had a clue of what was going on, they were pretty much already out of the house. So I think at a very young age, I already had this sense of like, uh, want to be challenged by things. I think a lot of skaters are naturally athletic. I was, always was, good at this, good at that, which is part of the pressure of like, hey, cool, you won world, champ world championships, who cares? Do something real, golf, baseball, legit, because you can do that. They put me in soccer once, and they purposely made me the goalie, I think, the first game. And it was like 12 nothing, and then they're pissed at me because I was like so scared that the... I didn't even play. I was just running around trying to hide from the ball. And we, <laughs> I don't even know why I played soccer this one game. I don't even know how it came about. I really don't, because I'm sure I didn't want to play it. And that was it. They're like, you're off the soccer team. I was pretty scrawny, and I wanted to be active. I wanted to do sports and things. I just didn't have the physical strength or the prowess to, to be good at them. So I just, I kind of felt like an outcast already because I didn't participate in the sort of mainstream activities. You know, I tried a lot of things that in school, like sports and basketball, soccer, football, and I mean, I played along, you know, but I always felt like I just, because of my size, and I felt that, that I just couldn't, you know, 
pull my weight in any of the kind of the team sports because everyone was a lot older, a lot bigger. I think when I started skateboarding, I was so young. I started skating at 10. There was a magazine, skateboard, with Steve Monaghan on the cover, cruising through water, and that's when it clicked, the magazines. I saw that photo and I was like, this is cool. <laughs> It was that photo on the cover, and I saw the photo of a guy through, riding through water going, oh, that's what I want. My dad wouldn't buy me a skateboard because, you know, he was raised in New York, and uh, he just thought, you know, skateboards, you're going to crack your head open, forget it, I'm not buying you one. So there was this girl on the next block over, she had an old board, and uh, I would go over there after school and ask her to borrow it, and I would just stay away from my house. And, uh, you know, I, I still remember the day I picked it up. I was like, well, how am I going to stand? Right foot forward, left foot forward? You know? What a gift. I often think that there's so many Beethovens out there that never found a piano. I trip over my feet when I can walk, but when I touch the skateboard, it, <clears throat> it worked. My older brother gave me his old board because he was a surfer and he skated a little bit. And I enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed that, that I did have some sort of social activity to do with, with neighborhood friends. The movement of going down the hill, it was a free, it was the poor man's roller coaster. I always wanted to go to Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm. Went to Knott's Berry Farm twice on my birthday. It was closed. You know, like that was, it was a type of, we just, everything went wrong for the mountains. I lived on a hill, so I would imagine as any kid, you know, or any person, the rush, you know, flying down a hill, you know, the total freedom of it. So I didn't need anything else after that, you know? I had skateboarding, that was it. I have such a sense of alienation of, I don't fit in. Never have, never felt it. Skateboarders themselves seem to be representative of a body of people who don't fit in, a collection of people who don't belong in collections. That drew me, we are fellow outcasts, and we find ourselves in mutual expression. The, the name that skateboarding had, the image, and all I saw is, man, that's what I want to be. I don't fit in on teams. I don't feel, I don't want to wear this. I don't, I don't belong. You know what? I don't want to belong. It's not that I can't belong. I don't want to belong. I want my voice. I want my distinctiveness. I want my individuality. I want my voice. I don't know what I want to do, but all I want to do is something that's fun. And skateboarding was the only thing that was fun. From day one, because, you know, I, myself and one other kid named Joe was the only guy who skated in, the whole, in high school. Nobody understood skateboarding. What's, you know... And, uh, you know, I didn't fit in with the jocks or the loadies or whatever. You know, I, just, I was just kind of a nice guy, I guess. Going to school, being at school, and always feeling like a loner, you know? I mean, that's what skating was for the black sheep, for the people, for the outcast. Um, and I always felt not quite like the rest of the kids. Right? I mean, uh, kids can be extremely cruel. And I think, I'm not quite sure, but being raised by my mom, maybe, I, you know, have a bit more sensitive um, and not the standard boy, you know? Um, so being in school, I got a lot of grief. You know, I was always the smallest kid. I was always, you know, getting picked on and stuff. Give me your lunch money, all that shit, you know? Especially bring in the when I started skating, it was just ridiculous. My board, I'm out, you know? Down the hill, goodbye. The reason why my neck is um, tilted to the side uh, is because I was born that way. And uh, my mother would always say, like, uh, yeah, it was because of this accident that I was in. I mean, you were born premature, so that was basically what I came to understand. Uh, because of one of my glands, um, is shorter than the other one, which pulls it to the side. And you know, when I was younger, I always would get teased about it all the time, but uh, I just never let it affect me. You know, I knew that was different just because of uh, the way people would treat me and the way I was perceived and, and you know, people would like look at me and, and uh, you know, tilt their head and go, why, why do you do that? And I go, I don't know, I was born like that, you know? So I just kind of pretty much accepted it on, you know, growing up. You know, when we first started skating bowls and stuff, and then we started trying to make ramps to duplicate these sections of bowls, we figured out that, you know, you didn't have much time between walls to do these tricks and set up. All the original homemade half pipes didn't have flat bottom. They were just, they were, we were called them super U's. They were just big U structures. So we started putting flat bottom and separating those walls um, so that you had more time 
to work on different tricks and go from trick to trick. And flat bottom allowed you to prepare for more tricks. It allowed you to get more speed. You actually pump when you go down and pump when you go up and then pump when you go back down again, which enables you to actually, you know, increase your speed so much to get even higher on airs and tricks and, you know, just adds a whole new dimension. Because those guys also came from a generation of wearing pads, you know, which was something that prior generations looked at as being totally pussy. It just was like an unmanly and, and where these guys didn't have any of these hang-ups. Their, their situation evolved as such that they knew that they had to get protection, you know, because of the fact that what they were trying to do was the next generation of extreme. If you were going to try anything up on top, the only way you're going to get out of it safely by falling is to slide on your knees down the wall. We took it for granted that knee sliding was how you fall. And in a lot of ways, it was as much a part of what you're doing as doing actual tricks. And the generation prior to us, they're wearing volleyball knee pads and on the roughest surfaces. And, and if you got up to the top, you had to figure out how you're gonna run out of it. When we grew up skating parks in Florida, some of our parks were finished in the rain with brooms. Okay, I mean, it was rough. So you don't care what kind of pad you had on, it was gonna rip it off. The skating was, was completely evolving faster than any of the support for it. So they had to wear padding, they had to wear helmets, because otherwise their careers would be really cut short. Nowadays, there's no way you'd build a pool or, or a uh, half pipe without flat. It would almost be a novelty, like, <laughs> let's just go see what we can do on that. It was super important, but it just, it just felt right. It wasn't like we were looking for it. We just found it, and all of a sudden it was like, of course this is how it should be. Tony's father, believe it or not, was one of the most important people in skateboarding in the 80s, and he was one of the most important people because he founded an amateur series, and he founded a pro series. I mean, Frank Hawk was basically, you know, a, a 1950s era dad, but grouchy. Frank was the most unlovable, lovable man you could imagine. He was the classic bull in a china shop. But the fact of the matter is he loved skateboarding. My dad was very intimidating. He was very gruff. He wanted people to follow his rules that he had created. And you're dealing with a, with a sport that is largely based on rebellion. And he wanted people to follow practice schedules and to follow you know, certain criteria to enter. He was up against a lot. And he helped start Castle, which was California Amateur Skateboard League. Um, and then he went on to form the NSA. My dad was an organizer at a moment in skating when it was completely disorganized. There were all these kids that had no, had no collective place to, to skate together or, or with or against each other. And so he started the series um, and uh, it became the, the amateur series. And then eventually uh, he saw that there was no pro series and so he started the National Skateboard Association, NSA, and, and started the NSA series. And NSA was the premier organization for skate events for the next 15 years. Frank Hawk made professional skateboarding happen in the 80s. He made it happen, got no money for it, he loved his child so much, he wanted to support him as much as he could, so he created this thing. that He saw that it was a positive impact on kids, and he hated that my friend's parents didn't want them skating. He hated that there was any sort of negative tone associated with skating. My dad loved skating. He loved what it, what it brought to me. He saw that it, it blossomed my whole personality. He would come off as the biggest grouch, and the biggest intimidator, but he was just, he was just a teddy bear, he was just, you know. If you really got under his skin, he would laugh hysterically, he was super funny, you know. And I mean, a lot of people, that's kind of a bummer about that era, is a lot of people didn't know how truly sarcastic and funny my dad was. And as, this, as these backyard contests built, and as skateboarding started to grow again, a few parks that still remained in existence, we started going back to the parks and having contests. And it was a vertical-based activity. But then something weird happened. 
a very strange thing happened. Stesic and George and I and, 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 and Fausto and all the other manufacturers, we started looking at this thing going, here we are, we're, we're promoting vertical to the exclusion of everything else. Only 15% of the kids that buy our products can ride vertical. This isn't gonna work. We're gonna destroy the sport for a third time. The mags were pretty much 90% vert, like all the photos, everything. You had to be able to afford a ramp, um, or you had to know the guy that had the ramp. I mean, that cut a lot of people out of the mix to be able to get into skateboarding. You're going like, this is dying, this is dead, skate parks are done, vertical is like only appealing to 15 people. Um, how do we keep this industry alive? Well, people are doing this. Two skateboarders, John Lucero and Richard Armeo, these are just amateur skateboarders skating at the Whittier Skateboard Park in California. They get kicked out of the park for life. They can never go back in this park. These kids have nothing else to do in the daytime. So every day they come to that skate park, they put their fingers in the fence and they look inside and they watch people skate. And they started skateboarding outside the park in the parking lot. And they started skating on uh, parking curbs. And they started doing all these weird vertical tricks on the street. And when all the pros would empty out of the park in the evening to have a hamburger or, or, or eat, they would skate with John Lucero and Richard Armejo in this parking lot. And they were doing all these weird little tricks, but it was looked at as a novelty, but yet it was fun, but no one took it seriously. That was the start of what would become known as street skating. It just happened happenstance, it was a mistake. We started looking at street skating going, we gotta make this happen. This is what kids can do. Street style and contest started evolving. You know, some of it was trying to mimic vert, right? It was still ramp oriented in the sense like a quarter pipe or a bank or a wedge or something like that. But it was, but it was trying to encompass all of those different elements and encompass the ditch and you know, the mini ramp and the, you know, the curbs and, and whatnot. And people were mimicking vertical and goofing around out in front of the skate parks and people did it from day one, they street skated. You know, I wanted to be Steve Caballero or Christian Hassoy or Tony Hawk or, you know, that, those guys were my heroes. Um, so not having access to ramps, you know, it was like we took the tricks that we saw in the magazines and we emulated them in the streets. But through doing that, something else started happening. We were throwing anything at the wall to figure out what is street skating. I really enjoy that because it was like this whole, ushering in this whole new style of skating. These guys were jumping down curbs, stairs, rails, you know. Um, it brought a whole new thing for skateboarding. And it was definitely a different sort of format than had been out there before, for sure. And we drew a lot of inspiration from freestylers too. I remember um, uh, Rodney Mullen and watching like him do a kickflip or All the Impossible and us thinking, we'd sit there and think like, dude, that would be cool to do on a big board. That wouldn't be cool. And one thing that we embraced and got excited about when we got into skateboarding was flat ground and just, just wanting to string tricks together and just have it look like it's flowing. And, and I just felt like, you know, what he was innovating, it just really looked like it could be done on a bigger board. And we saw that and we just kind of, drew inspiration from that. I think, you know, he, he's a huge part of the vocabulary you know, for street skating. We talked about that a lot and um, we were consciously aware of it. We focused on convincing other people in the industry that we needed to allow skateboarding to grow in areas that were fertile and w could allow it to grow and not take it off a cliff or stick it in a rock garden. And I've heard that, you know, behind the scenes, people like yourself and Stasek and, you know, Fausto, it was like there was a movement in the, in the industry t to foster, nurture, create street skating. But I think it would have fucking happened on its own. The industry needed to capitalize on these things to make it survive and be healthy. The industry needed to stay, say, hey, this is what that is. And we didn't want to kill bird skating. We just wanted to be inclusive. And it was street, you know, street style, right? The name to market, I, I suppose. I think it was like all, you know, concocted, of course. Thrasher sort of, you know, um, started focusing more on street skating. And they seen that, um, how accessible and how um, it could be something, the next wave. And I think that they really um, tuned in into that and started promoting it. 
through the mags and through, you know, and, and uh, it started getting out there. There was so many people starting to street skate because they didn't have those ramps and parks available to them. This was becoming a huge, a huge thing, you know, part of skating. It wasn't just a, a pastime or something we did recreationally or uh, a sport, you know, it was our lives. I think more so than the actual act of doing it, it was like what it gave to you as an individual, like what it meant. It was like, we were not under thumb. We were not, the rules did not apply to us. We saw the world differently. It was profound. I mean, I, I understood that there was something special about this and it wasn't just, it wasn't, it wasn't just sport, you know? It was, it wasn't structured. It, there was no rules to it, and there was a freedom that came with it, uh, and it was expressive. It was like I could just get on my board and it, it, I could communicate it, even if it was just communicating it to, to the howling wind. It was communicated. It got out of my system, and uh, and I recognized that as being something something special, something meaningful. And the classic image in the skate video of Mike sitting in his parents' house and he stands up and grabs his board and opens the front door and he's skateboarding. And the message to every kid who ever saw that video was skate, your skateboard park begins at your front door. Wherever your door is, that's skateboarding. You do not need a skateboard park. You don't need a ramp. Skateboarding is in you. And that was, and, and kids just, they freaked. They freaked on that message, which was just a suggestion. You know, I was, when I was 16, I was interviewed by the local paper, and they said, well, what's so great about it? Like, why do you guys, what's so great about skating? And I said, we can have a major session right here. All we need is this sidewalk and this wall. You know, it's about making something out of nothing. I can't tell you how much I skated in front of my house, I'm in my driveway alone, or, you know, I'd go down the shopping center at night under a streetlight by myself and just do it, you know? It was like, I wasn't doing it for anyone's acceptance. I wasn't doing it for, you know, for show or any of that. It was like I had to do it. The really good skaters are really creative because you have to look at things in, a, in an unmapped way. You have to look at something and go, how am I going to skate this? How am I gonna, going to adapt to, to, to this obstacle? I mean, but the highest thing you can do is skate something that's not meant to be skated. And then in, in the um, what is it, maybe late, or early 80s, uh, the first street contest that happened in Golden Gate Park that Thrasher threw. We're like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is what we do on the way to the skate park. We're waiting on the bus, like, slapping a curb and walking on a plant. Like, we thought it was silly. And like, you guys are doing contests with this stuff? You're serious? You're saying this is an actual legitimate thing? This is absurd. Like, that's what I, my first impression was. This is what we do because we want to be goofy, and now you're trying to, like, make this official. And all of a sudden, all these people that aren't goofy are trying to come be goofy with us? That's kind of what I thought. Like, this is lame. Like, you're trying to make a, a profession out of being a goofball. That was our thing. Built a bunch of ramps. It was on a slight hill in Golden Gate Park. There was a couple parking blocks and, and whatnot. Um, and there was a bunch of vert pros. You'd see street contests, but it was like the vert skaters skating street, and the way they approached it was doing vert tricks on little chopped up vert kind of thing. From that very first day, from that first street style contest, everything just really took off. I mean, it really started changing. And so street skaters started to emerge. Visions Mark Gonzalez, Santa Monica Airlines Nautis Coppice, Tommy Guerrero, Jesse Martinez, Mike Vallely, Ray Barbie. And so we started picking up street skaters, guys that didn't ride vertical, which was a whole nother paradigm shift, a complete unique thing. And a lot of people didn't get it. Like, what, you're just a street skater? You're amp what, you're gonna be a pro street skater? Like, that doesn't even exist, what are you talking about? You know, even guys on the team were like, what are you doing? Lance got on my case because he thought we were trying to create something that shouldn't exist. There was a lot of flack about it. Frank Hawk, Tony's father, who ran the vertical contests, at first was against street contests. He was like, no, you, you can't do this. So it created a, a split among skaters and in the industry we had never intended. And so our team, composed mostly of 
vert skaters, the best, um, didn't have any street skaters. So we started looking for street skaters. In the 70s, we didn't know what skateboarding was going to be. Was it going to be pool skating, bank skating, freestyle skating, downhill skating, slalom skating? Was it going to be high jump, barrel jump? There were so many things we, that we thought it might be. And the fact is, we didn't know what it wanted to be. So in the early 80s, it seemed like ramps were going to be the thing. That's what kids were gravitating towards. That's the beauty of street skating. You walk out your door and you go. You don't like, oh, I have to go travel across the world to go skate some shitty ramp. Um, you know, it's all about access. So I looked at what Rodney was doing and then where guys like Tommy and Natus and Gons were taking it to the next le level, came from the invention of what Rodney was doing and made it accessible for every kid to roll along and hop up a curb, which really was the essence of skating through the late 80s and into the 90s and when street skating exploded was that simple concept of getting up a curb. And remember, going way back into the early 80s, he had all that stuff, but nobody paid attention. I mean, he was doing all these three years before Street Skater was doing it. So I look at him as the godfather of why skating is where it is now. You could just see that street had the access for everybody to do around the world. People were going out in parking lots and, you know, taking a car jack or whatever and take, stealing parking blocks. It was great. I think the very first contest might have been Sacto and then after that maybe Oceanside, 84 Oceanside. And I remember thinking to myself going, this is gonna take over. And I didn't have any intention of turning pro until actually, which is the craziest thing, is Lee Cole from Skates on Hates had a talk with me one day and he just, he had said, you know, well, why not? And I was like, well, I mean, it doesn't exist. You know, there's no such thing as a pro street skater, you know? And he's like, kind of like, well, there's gotta be a first, right? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. And to be a pro street skater was, you know, uh, just completely new, 1985. And it was first, was me and Mark Gonzalez entered that contest in Sacramento. A lot of people on the team weren't into it. They didn't, they just were not happy that I was being a pro street skateboarder. Street skating was Mark Gonzalez, Tommy Guerrero, Jesse Martinez, and Nottis Coppice. I became, you know, I was like the great white trash hope. <laughs> you know, it's like, I was the kid that could represent the other kids and made it, oh, it's real. It could really happen. Like, this could really happen. You know, if you lived in Indiana or you lived in Virginia or New Jersey or Louisiana, like, this kid did it. I had actually made a skateboarding video in 1982, but there was no such thing as a VCR and no one ever saw this little thing. It was like 15 minutes long. In 1984, I was living in Hollywood. My next door neighbor was a friend of mine, D. David Morin, who had been the publisher of Skateboarder Magazine. He was in film school. He said, you know what, I have an idea. My best friend Dan Donnelly and I, who's also a filmmaker, would like to make a skateboard video for you and George. We'll charge you five grand, make a half hour video for you. I went to George, I said, what do you think? D. David and Dan want to make this video for us. They're charged five grand. And George, actually, it was the quick, it was the strangest thing. George just looked at me and goes, good idea. He typically had to weigh things and think about things and have time, but he was instant. Good idea, let's do it. And so, D. David was also a television actor, a commercial actor, and the day we were supposed to begin shooting the video, which was at Lance's ramp, D. David got a chance to be in a TV commercial, and he couldn't be on the set. So his friend Dan came in to take over. Well, it, it turns out that I didn't get along with Dan that well, and I thought he was shooting things improperly. It turns out he wasn't, but I thought he was. And so after the first day, I fired him, and I decided I'm gonna just do this myself. I didn't know how to do it, but I did it. And so six months later, I had enough material to make an hour-long video show, which I ended up editing in my apartment in Hollywood. I set up a little video editing system, tape to tape, on my kitchen table, and I just edited this thing together. I didn't go to film school. I didn't start out as a young filmmaker. I didn't even know I'd ever make films. I had no intention of that. I stumbled into this. We originally made videos because we thought they would play in skateboard shops and that kids would congregate in skateboard shops. We didn't know that by 1988, 70% of American households would have VCRs. We didn't know that. They 
became a way for kids to see what skateboarding was like in real life in three dimensions from start to finish. And the videos, in a sense, if you look at it, they were based on the surf film model. And that's, that's how we thought, and that's how we constructed them. And the beginning video was such a humble experience that we premiered it in, in the living room of Mr. and Mrs. Hawk. I mean, that's how humble it was. Mr. and Mrs. Hawk were there. Tony was lying on the floor, you know, on a pillow, watching like that. Kevin Staub was there. Lynn Cooper was there. I was, I, I was standing in the kitchen with Steve Hawk, Tony's brother. And everyone looked at it and went, oh, that was fun, that was fun. No one had any clue what was gonna happen. But I, I will say one thing about that video. It's Tony Hawk's piece in that video that was really the starting point for his true career because that was the moment people could no longer ignore him. And that was the moment that he started to come of age because people could actually see, oh my God, this kid is really doing stuff that's different. That was it, it was that demarcation point. And from that point forward, Tony Hawk began his ascent. When we first started shooting the videos, they were all shot on what's called three-quarter inch videotape, which is probably the ugliest video format that has ever been created on Earth. It's just ugly. But as time got, went by, we started developing, you know, we started using Super 8 cameras and 16 millimeter cameras and Craig's military cameras and high-speed cameras. And we tried to get the camera moving. How do we get the camera moving? And it finally came down to the fact that I just realized I'm gonna skate behind these guys holding a camera. And so I learned how to skate forwards, backwards, holding the camera. I put cameras on broomsticks and I skated down streets. We made rigs over Tony Hawk's ramp where we, where we pulled you know, cameras on a clothesline to follow Tony over the top. It was like our gang. We were doing anything we could to make it different and also to challenge ourselves. You know, we, we made cameras that spun on an axis so we could follow a McTwist around. We, we, we bought little teeny military cameras and put them in Lance's hands so we could follow Tony Hawk. I had cameras in my hand in, in the New York sequence and we're sh you know, going through crowds of people and stuff like that. But I think the primary thing that we did is we not only showed these guys skating great, but we showed them being dorks. And we showed them falling and slamming so that we could show that, man, they're great skateboarders. They're the best in the world, but they're also kids. They're also young. They're also, they're dorks just like you are, just like I am. But, but the video pinnacle seems to be Animal Chin. And we made Animal Chin for two reasons. One, because Caballero said he wanted to act. And number two, as I said, because we wanted to create, we wanted to remind ourselves why we were doing what we were doing because we were at the height of our success. The story is about the search for fun. And that's why we do skateboarding in the first place. So that's really what the video is all about. It's a lot more welcoming to go, we're here making fun of ourselves, even if we're better skaters than you or more successful or whatever, than to kind of go, this is how rad I am, this is how awesome I am by doing a 30 foot air or whatever. In Bones Brigade video one, they're skating this, crappy ditch and there's a wedding going on and just that juxtaposition of of these guys in dirty jeans and stuff skating a sewer ditch right beside a wedding i mean that that impacted me it, it, it taught me a value system which i don't even know if, if it was intentional it didn't even in a weird way highlight the tricks it highlighted the the camaraderie of skating with people it wasn't like a, a lot of videos now where there's some sort of trick porn where it's just like money shot, money shot, money shot. This was the exact opposite where you had people skating, everyday type of skating, but together. And you had lots of reaction shots where people were cheering each other on and doing, doing that. And that, that to me was like, that's what I want to get out of skating. You want skating to be this thing you're doing on your own. You don't want other people who don't skate to look at it and be able to relate to it and go, that's awesome. Here's your reward sort of thing. You want it to be this thing where all the rewards are, are, come from the community and, and come from what they value. And to me, that, that's what that scene was at SAC, though, where you have people sitting in a car smashing it, you have people in ripped up jeans. Nobody, it, it's a contest, nobody's really doing a serious contest run. I mean, it, it didn't even show us like a winning contest run. It didn't show you how to win a contest, it just showed you an organic community of, of skaters would put together on their own. Rasher started in that paper format right around 82, 83. So things were starting to, to show that there was, there was a comeback. The Thrasher magazine itself was a reaction. Like skateboarder was corporate, like Thrasher was anarchy. You went from a glossy magazine to a black and white magazine. Like there was like the original Bible and then there was like the new Bible. 
and they were like the new Bible. Because we finally had our own magazine too that spoke our language too. Is that it wasn't something that was published by guys that were trying to candy coat it. You know, we couldn't have a candy coated image with skateboarding because that's not real. And the kids knew it, and the kids wanted what was real. You know, Thrasher, by uh, you know, doing what they did, helped bring that back in a big way. The magazine itself was owned by one of the biggest manufacturers at the time, but that manufacturer had an understanding of, you know, this is for the kids, and this is, the only, and this is what Thrasher magazine's gonna be. It's the publishers, uh, Fausto, rest in peace, and maybe even the editor too, Kevin Thatcher, this was their chance you know, to start their own revolution in skateboarding. And, and, and not for the sake of revolution, because it needed to happen, because nothing was happening that exciting anymore. The sport was kind of, you know, you know going through a re a, some real growing pains. It was really tough. First of all, you had a bunch of guys who never ma had made a magazine. You had guys that were learning how to shoot pictures, right? And, and they were learning on the fly how to do the mechanics of a publication. And, you know, it didn't matter that the writing wasn't that good. It didn't matter that the, photo, the, the printing quality wasn't that good. People, you know, kids just wanted something that was just about what they cared about, something that was from their heart, um, you know, that they believed in. They didn't want to see all this, you know, soft talk about skateboarding. Even though it was that paper format and you looked at it and your hands were all black after looking through it, it was something. It was, it was something to know that there's a recovery process here, and it was something to show that the true skaters out there, the skaters all over, still all over the world at that point, but it, you know, had taken a big dive as the amount of skaters. It was that ray of hope going, here it goes. It, it's it's going to take some time, but it, it's going to make that comeback. The, the manufacturers wanted to make believe that skateboarding was not a rebellious thing, was not a subversive thing. What happened in the 80s is we said, screw it. It is rebellious. It is subversive. And Craig Stesick coined the term skate and destroy. And it personified what skateboarding was and it was to become. That's what it was gonna be. We're no longer gonna hide from the fact that no one wants us. We're no longer gonna hide from the fact that we're destroying architecture, that we're loud, that people don't like us, that they're scared when we roll down the street. We're not, we're not, we're gonna embrace it. And so we embraced the fact that skateboarding is illegal, should remain illegal. When Craig wrote that article, Skate and Destroy in Thrasher, I think it was about 1983, and it was really like a new call to arms for skateboarding. I mean, I, I really think it was, he was trying to instigate a revolution again in skateboarding. The magazine got a lot of crap for it. I think that, um, I mean, you just, just like, you know, in some ways what he was doing with the Dogtown articles, you know, skateboarding had come so far and it kind of fell off and, and maybe he saw some of the mistakes of the past and saw what was going on in, indus in the industry itself again. There's apologies within the article for the article itself, but it, it really is a call to revolution for the sport. My name is Charlie Trevillo, I'm a senior programmer here at Sundance, and I want to welcome you to the documentary premiere section of our festival and these world premiere screenings of Bones Brigade, an autobiography. <laughs> welcome back to the program, Stacey Peralta. Damn, Stacey. We've had an amazing experience so far at the, this festival, which is the most, it's, it's the gold standard if you're an independent filmmaker. Thanks to the Sundance Film Festival for allowing us to be here. I know you guys have a lot of choices. I know you have a lot of films that you could go to. I so appreciate, or we appreciate you coming to see ours. Feel free to use your cell phones. If any of you get important calls, let us know and we'll mute the sound of the film. We're really easy about that stuff, okay? Out of the six individuals that are featured in the film, five are with us tonight. We're going to be here at, uh, for the Q&A after the film. We're having a really wonderful time in your state, and um, enjoy the film. Please welcome the man who helped us survive 
the 1980s. Please welcome back Stacy. Uh, Tony Hawk could not be here to join us. He made a contract to be in Australia over a year ago. He's cursing himself. He couldn't be here, trust me. And he's, uh, we're, we're texting him every day. So please, if any of you have any questions, fire him at us, because we're here to, uh, to talk and, and enjoy our time with you. Can I get a handshake or a hug from you guys? <laughs> when we're all done, yes, when we come down off the stage, <laughs> it's five bucks a hug. <laughs> When we were coming up here, Rodney said, I know there's a lot of snow up there. Will there be a place for me to skate? As soon as he got off the plane, the first, and this is no lie, we had to go all over Park City to find him a place to skate between 2 and 6 in the morning. And we went to various parking garages, and Rodney assessed each one. Like, no, this one will get too wet because of the snow tires. I need something lower. i got to make sure there's no garage door that's going to lock me in here. He has, in fact, been out there till 3. He was out, what, 3.30 last night? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting personal with me and the security guard down there. <laughs> <laughs> we have not, as a group, been together, as I said, in about 22 years. And it's so great to be together again, and based on the little you can hear of him, we've had these unbelievable conversations, as well as laugh riots from Lance <laughs> and Tommy that have been out of control. It was a joy to make this film. Um, these guys asked me to make it about eight years ago, and we kept tumbling the idea around it. Lance called me a year and a half ago and said, look, we really want to make this film. We are now older than you and Tony Alpha were when you made Dogtown. So we all got together for a meeting at the Los Angeles International Airport at a restaurant. And when I heard Rodney open his mouth, I went, we got it. This is going to work. And I'm, that's the truth. I mean, I, he just started articulating, and I went, we can make a film here. And the day we decided to embark on this uh, film, it just unrolled itself. It was the easiest production that either Josh and I have ever been on. It was as if it wanted to get made. These guys just opened up and took the interviews and took the story in a place that I had never seen or intended. I remember walking out of the first day, the first interview with Rodney saying, this is not what I was expecting. I had a natural fear of, gosh, I, I, I don't know how to frame this. I, I talked to Stacey beforehand and I go, look, I, I can't extricate who I am at that time and some of the problems that I had. I can't tell you who I am without going into that and I'm afraid to let it all go. And so will you just give me your word that you will just work with me? And Stacey was so good. I had no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, any questions about Stacy were asked by someone else to us. How do you feel about me? Well, <laughs> I don't agree with that. <laughs> I wanted to say the newest member of our Bones Brigade team is our editor, Josh Altman. He did such an amazing job. I've been really, really fortunate as a director to work with great editors. Previous to this film, I had produced a film that Josh cut, and his work just blew my mind. And I asked him if he would get involved in this, and because I was in this film, and it was much more personal than Dogtown, there were passages, many passages, I just had to say, Josh, this is yours, I don't know what to do here, see you later. And um, working with him is an absolute, total joy. Feelings mutual, obviously. <laughs> it was an honor to come on and to be a part of this film and to be a part of, uh, you know, bringing this story to the screen. The sills, by the way, are all, Stacy does that. Most of it's not done on my end, it's done on his end. He, he shoots that. He films those photographs and within, um, you know, my editing system, I can play with those. But for the most part, that, that's what makes them look so raw and beautiful. And we let them really play with all the jitters and whatever came with it, whether there was a, a hiccup or whatever, because we just like that rock quality. I think that's what skateboarding is. There was a lot of stuff that we cut beforehand. Eventually we just came to realize just how, how meaningful these guys are, just their experiences that they went through. And not so much the overall you know, community of skateboarding. That plays a part, but not as much as hearing you know, what each of them went through and, and how they got to where they were. And that's how we found this story, but he was instrumental in drawing out the emotion and, and finding the right tone of the film. We had to cover the historical moments of what happened there, 
but we tried to make tell that story through them and their struggles and their, their you know overcoming their obstacles. And they all had different ones. As Rodney once said, they never sang in harmony, but they worked as a group. And so um, yeah, that was the intention. Uh, so all the old you have, John Oliver, stand up a second. This is the mastermind in charge of archiving all of the hundreds of hours of footage over the past 10 years, and he's the one that did it. And the film really was made by John, Josh, and myself. We had no crew, we had no offices whatsoever. But John knew where literally everything was, and he had organized it over the years. And George, as well, has, has done an amazing job at cataloging the thousands of photographs. When you go to the company, over the past 10 years, he's really painstakingly laid this stuff out completely, year by year, personality by personality, so it made it a lot, lot easier. Yeah, there's eight of Tommy Guerrero's pieces of music in the film. I'm just kind of curious how Fred Durst and Ben Harper became involved in the project. For people that are not skaters, we need to have recognizable names in the film to let others know that what the impact that these guys had on them. They had a huge impact on Ben Harper, Fred Durst, Shepard Ferry, and whatnot. And we thought those guys would, you know, kind of provide a bridge to people that don't understand skateboarding. So that was the reason. I was looking for people that were, you know, had some sense of accomplishment in their life that viewers could understand, wow, these Bones Brigade guys really did impact a lot of people. I've stepped in and out of Stacy's shoes several times throughout those last 20 years I've made videos actually behind the camera, edited, did all that kind of thing, obviously learning from him. And taking guys on trips and stuff. And I remember one time I took about 10 dudes to Europe, and that was the last time. I, mean, <laughs> I was not as forgiving as Stacy by any means, because I was still just a stupid, dirty skater. And I, and I couldn't put up with it. I gave everyone's off right now. Hey, you could be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to get pizza. I'm going to get pizza. I'm seriously put the tape down. Here you go. <laughs> My parents always supported me. They let me do whatever. They're they're awesome. We had real fun around the house. It was goofy and weird and strange, but it was we were goofy, and weird, and strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a therapist, Rodney, I want to know what your dad thought of this waste of profession. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> he has a weird word. <laughs> You sell overpriced pieces of wood to unsuspecting little kids. Um, I've been skating since 1976. Still skate today, and my only injury that's been probably the worst one is a broken ankle in 1991. <laughs> That's what happens when you're that good. Uh, Lance severed his head from what I recall. <laughs> Lance, you okay? Yep. Oh yeah, it wasn't even a bad slam, don't worry. You're so lame. The worst one is a broken ankle. I have pins and a plate and it's still. So yeah, stitches in my head a couple times and I don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 13, uh, I had a bunch of older friends five, six years older than me. They always took me to skate some pools. I was excited, so I took my dad to show him pool skating. And I woke up in the hospital five hours later. <laughs> he told me I, would never, I couldn't skate again. Um, the older kids let me come watch them skate the pool if I wore a helmet. <laughs> Thing. I broke my arm two times in a row. The day it healed, I started skateboarding again, and I felt I broke it that day. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good day. <laughs> the deal was that I was supposed to quit skateboarding the first time I got hurt. My dad was a dentist, <laughs> so it was perfect. And the first thing that went was my tooth. <laughs> Can you tell a little bit about that sort of marriage between humanity and technology that happened between well, where is George? Let's bring him down here. He was a, a college graduate. I was a high school graduate. I had street sense, and he had the knowledge how to design the materials. Yeah, you'd think that I was the technology, and Stacy was the humanity, or certainly that's true. Our relationship was one of collaboration, and I think Stacy often brought great ideas of a technical nature. 
and I like to think that sometimes I had an idea that helped work for me. <laughs> oh, I like to think that. Thank you, Stacey. We're good to this day. Your role as innovators and inventors versus other people who are kind of building off the tricks that, that, that you guys invented. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. I thought that was really fascinating. There's a distinction between variation and creation. None of us has it in us all the time to create. Arguably, you know, what is created, what isn't really a variant on something that already pre-exists. And in our case, as I talk about the isolation in the film, and a huge part of it is just a simple belief that you can do what you have not yet seen. And as we came together and seeing, again, these mutant powers of Tony Hawk and the rest of the guys, and having the belief in that laugh of Stacy to make us believe and to conjure get inspiration that you can't just start from here, it has to come out of you. Those are the engines of real creation my perspective because it's so easy to fall into seeing what someone does and tweaking it into a variation as though someone else couldn't figure that out because come on man everyone sees and knows and has that yearning to do something different the difference is being able to do it so that's what the community became for as is quite evident rodney is smarter than our collective iq <laughs> I was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2010. I wouldn't have been, in my opinion, had I not been associated with these guys. And I've always felt, <clears throat> it's them that made me who I was. My luck in working with these guys has made me who I was. Look from our perspective, someone that represented with such authenticity, who he was, the belief you had in us, is what inspired and lifted us and enabled us to do what we did, it changed our lives and gave us meaning. Is it the nature of things that all good things have to come to an end? Well, Rodney's the physicist. <laughs> he might be able to give us the answer on that. It's a bit of a nerd thought, but... <laughs> There is a spectrum. We all seek some form of appreciation and belonging and acceptance, right? The spectrum between genuine respect and then as fame creeps in, it's a broader acceptance from people who don't really get you. And if you're not getting it from the very beginning, from your peers or people who represent something of real value to you, as Stacy did to us and the rest of the team, then you can easily mistake that and start to think, oh wow, fame, all these people, they yell my name, they think I'm all of that, when that is so empty compared. And so the guys that often got really famous and they became disoriented because what they saw the whole time was what we had in the inner community and they spin out of control. I see that quite a lot and there's particular dangers of that today. We all are very humbled of what we've been able to do in our lives and it's very easy to get caught up in the nonsensical fame and the money. We didn't ever want that to pervade this film, that these are just normal guys that, that happen to pursue their dream, and we all got lucky, and we all got to do it. And we don't want to set any barriers between us and anybody else. So that was the goal. Our careers were cut very short in the 70s. We were uh, pro skaters for three years, and I don't feel we ever got to develop properly and I really wanted that dream that these guys eventually got to live. When I started assembling them, I got so much joy that I missed out of my own career living through them. And so in a sense, I had that career. It just came naturally to pick them up at airports, listen to them talk on the phone and, and hang out with them. I just liked them and I liked them as people. You know, we had a lot of fun together and what's weird is we're still having that fun together after all this time. And I like each one of them for the same reasons I liked them then. And disliked. <laughs> you guys have been the most incredible audience to show this to. You have made us feel so welcome. Thank you so very much. People who don't are in this world don't understand like the legendary status you got. Like, talk about what it was like at the height when you would show up to an event. 
Tony Hawk would walk in and we would call him. I am going to have fun and I'm going to do what I want to do even if I have to be miserable doing it. <laughs> An audience that uh, you know didn't skateboard. Do they? Do you feel that they get it? They understand it? Yeah, we had a, a, our second screening at Sundance. We had a lot of middle-aged people that didn't skateboard that didn't even know why they came to the film. <laughs> um, and at the Q and A, it ended up getting very, very emotional. There was tears in the audience, and there was tears on our side. We, I, I had grown men coming up to me, hugging me. No, seriously, Rodney had women coming up to him, crying. <laughs> Stacy and Tracy, I don't understand why two of the badass guys that I know both have girls' names. <laughs> when a film of mine does connect, it gives me strength, man. It makes me realize, okay, I'm not nuts. I can do this again. I can make this happen. <laughs> yeah. You can keep interviewing him, it's okay. I will never, ever forget this. <laughs>
hackers and, and, and technologists in the sense that really what, what, what software hackers do is they figure out, painstakingly they figure out very, very difficult problems and they do it for the intrinsic joy of it. It's kind of like a, a code that other skaters will emulate, build upon. It's a lot like software. There's also a, a, a similar kind of anti-authority strain. Is that a reasonable view or is that just my own bias because I'm into technology? Not at all. That is such a good analogy. If anything, I'm, I, I love Linux. And the open source community, is it's so much like the open source community. And it's funny, if skaters, or when they do, when they nerd out at that level, I just think of Linux community, it's extremely similar to the skateboard community for just what you say. And the elegance with which they do, and the pride they take in that, and the way it shares and becomes open to all of us, where we build and share for, from one another's work, it's exactly the same. Skateboarding is illegal in most places that we do it. Mm -hmm. It's illegal in the street, and so you're constantly taught to look over your shoulder, to know when to be somewhere and when not to be somewhere, to recognize who might want you out of there, and so you learn to be very crafty, and you learn to operate, I don't want to say in an illegal manner, but you do operate in an illegal manner, and so you learn certain street smarts while you're practicing your craft. Yeah, it's just survival, you know? Um, you nurture these instincts based on you know what's going on around you, your environment, and what you're trying to do at that moment in time. You know, you you know you have okay, we have 30 seconds. It takes the security guard 45 seconds to walk around here. You got 30 seconds to pull the trick and 15 seconds to run. You know, you, you really it really gets down to that. Um, the way skaters approach uh, life is is altered by the the way they perceive um, you know the objects around them. You know, like I will never look at a rail or stairs or a ledge or anything the same way ever again for, until I'm six feet deep. And so therefore, the way you approach life and the way you perceive it is going to be different no matter what. And that's one of the things that I believe leads to creativity, you know, whether it be the visual, the audible, or the written. And because it, it, it really creates this way of seeing completely differently. How are uh, kids today different? Because you mentioned that, you know, street skaters are skating on surfaces not designed for them, but a lot of kids today have surfaces that are designed for them. And do they grow up with a, a different mentality, do you think? It's much more available to them now than it was to us. I mean, we really had to search out, you know, being being pool skaters, originally we had to search out empty swimming pools and the, the very limited number of skate parks that were dwindling before our eyes as we, as we were getting into it. So now they know that those those facilities are available to them, say skate park facilities. Um, they know the spots to skate, they know that they're going to have other friends that will be skating there as well. So many more people speak their language than, say for us, most of us here, we went to high school as complete outcasts. No one spoke their language, no one identified with what you did. And now there's there are plenty of kids that do that, so there's a more sense of a belonging. Many of you guys are still pro skaters, right? They all are. How do you how do you pull that off? As I understand it, in, in Stacy's day, it was like a couple of years, and 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 then that was the end of you know you're 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 not a teenager anymore, so now it's time to become a award winning filmmaker or something. So so how do you, how do you manage to, to to have a you know continue to be a pro skater? Well, I think it goes back to what Rodney said is. Um if it is all only athletics, then the younger guy will take you out. But if you have a creative mind, then you're going to constantly come up with things that are still catching someone's eye or thought. And if you can do that, then you can still have a position in skateboarding. A lot of people who have seen the film say that although it takes place in the skateboarding world, it's a story that transcends the sport. I think that's kind of why I and maybe some of the other guys really hounded Stacy to make this thing because it was going to be made, or a story about the 80s was going to be made, or a story of people were talking about it, and I know the footage was going to get used up, and other people wanted to do it, and we were just... Stacy's the only one that we thought wouldn't just tell the story of skateboarding. We wouldn't have opened up nearly as much to anyone else but Stacy, so the fact that he was so deeply embedded in the story, and that we trust him, and we trust how he's going to put all the interweave all of our stories together you know that that's the only way you're going to get a truly open honest conversation with any of us you know what are you working on right now what are the projects either either you know professional business philanthropic or or otherwise i actually spent a lot of time just nurturing my friendships and hanging out with my wife and and, and uh, trying to change something infrastructural to my skating so um so i can look at it with fresh eyes 
and hopefully I, can... I, I understand that you've sw you late in your life you sw you're switching your stance yeah that's 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 an endeavor again it's an infrastructural change brought about by medieval means <laughs> <laughs> There's more well, it sounds that. painful. <laughs> <laughs> and Stacy, uh, we we know what you're working on. You're working on this movie. Um, what are you going to be working on after after this thing is uh, released into the wild? I've got a lot of work ahead of me in the next six months in releasing this film. A lot of press to do. A lot of work to do. So um, I've got to kind of keep myself open to that. It's all on I, your own. All on your own. Yeah, all on my own. <laughs> These guys are going to bail once this interview's <laughs> done. They're gone. <laughs> So that's it. Eddie, what are you doing in Australia? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually on tour uh, at, at a, a concert tour called Big Day Out, and um, I guess I'm one of the headlining acts, but we have a ramp like right next to the main stage. We really missed you at Sundance, man. Yeah. We had a great time. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Getting torturous, torturous texts and updates from Sean Mortimer, who was there with you guys. <laughs> well, um, congratulations on this movie, and congratulations on all of your uh, successes and uh, everything else. And thank you so much for taking the time to do this uh, hangout with us. And uh, again, you guys are are legendary, and um, and I uh, wish you all the best. And I uh, hope this this uh, movie is a ginormous success. Thanks for thank having you. us on. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks, Mike, for teaching me how to do a hangout. <laughs>
a kind of who's who of skateboarders in the audience that they have come to share this moment with us. We would like to share our gratitude with them. My brothers, Tony Alva, Jay Adams, Steve Olson, Dwayne Peters. And there are many, many more, but I really, we really appreciate this. This is kind of the spiritual home for this company, the company, the skateboard company, the Swan Boat Brigade, has been here for 36 years. Anyways, we've had a fantastic run on this film. Five of the individuals that you'll see in the film are here tonight. We're gonna to do a Q&A afterwards. Again, thank you very much, enjoy the film, and please feel free to make a lot of noise. We've got some guys we're going to bring out. Steve Caballero. Lance Mountain. Rodney Mullen. Stacy Peralta. Mike McGill. And Tommy Guerrero. Some other guy. Hello, hello. And our editor, Josh Altman. Yeah, Josh. Um, can someone get George's walker and bring him up here? <laughs> um, on behalf of the guys, I just want to say that you guys have been the rowdiest audience we've ever had. Um, I'd like to invite one more person that belongs uh, up here with us. Can Craig Stesick please join us? Yes, Stesick. All you up, Craig. This is a question for everybody. Obviously, look at this crowd and look at the crowds at Sundance. The film has hit a nerve. What do you think it is about this film, all of you guys, that is making people so excited? Anybody want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Rodney's the best. Because the, <laughs> because the film shows not so much what we do, but who we are as a community. And that is what we were imbued through the leadership of Stacey Peralta, and this is us together. That's who we are. Hey Amen. Yes, you do. <laughs> this is a question for Mike. You're, you're known so much for the McTwist, but looking back now, is there another legacy that, that you're proud of as well, in addition to the tricks that you guys all did? Um, well, you know, just being a part of uh, these guys' lives, um, you know, I spent more than half my life with them. <laughs> well, well, a long time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's such an honor to be part of, uh, of something that you believe in. And Steve, okay, another theme that was running through this film, I think, was there's a lot of sort of things that weren't necessarily happy with the, with the normal family, but these guys became your uh, de facto family. And just wondering if you can talk about that and how that feels to be with them again now. Steve. Am I stoked to be up here with these guys? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> no, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing uh, how this has come full circle and uh, the things that we've accomplished and the friends that we've met and just, it's just amazing. I mean, just all you guys here, seeing all the old faces and stuff. Thank you guys, love you guys. A lot of people in the crowd are actually the reason why we're up here as well. I mean, they had a lot to do, to do with our success, so we thank you. Totally. Okay, are there questions from the audience? Yes, sir. These guys are like your kids, so I wanted, you know, like, you haven't lost any of them. They're all still alive. How are you going to feel if you ever were to lose one of them? Lose one of these guys? <laughs> It would be, it would be fish out of water. 
It would be heartbreaking. It would be worse for one of them to go for skateboarding itself because of what they've given, the contribution that these guys have made. This is a question for Rodney. Was the end of the importance of contests a relief or a disappointment for you? Sorry, the end of When contests stopped being an, as such a big thing, like freestyle contests, was that a relief or was that uh, was that sad for you? Man, it was such a relief. It was such a huge relief. Again, like, Tony said it well in the movie, because we were afraid to lose. We were all good at what we did. And so you just, skating when you weren't in contest became very repetitive. Just get it dialed, do it 10 times in a row, whatever. And when the pressure of the contest was reduced or vanished, it allowed the joy again. You just started to aim at whatever you wanted to do to just do something for the sake of it, right? Like what Lance was saying. So it begins and it's always something new. And that's the part, where, that's the real joy of it for me and always has been. And Tommy, why don't you tell us a little more about that week at Sundance? Uh, any good stories from there? And were, did you all fall back into the same roles you had 20 years ago, or were things different? Actually, to be honest, um, seeing these guys and coming back when we all met up at Sundance, and we actually did share a house. We had a couple houses, and it was. What's funny is I'm the street skater, right? And everyone's like, street skating? What? What? That's a profession? Like, what the hell? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I pioneered it. So, so I slept on the couch, right? Like low man on the totem pole. You're like, I didn't invent the McTwist or the Caballero or the Ollie. So I slept on the couch. So when, we, when everybody came home, when we came home, I was on the couch and I'm listening to these amazing stories that these guys have had before I was on the team. And I'm with a blanket over my head like, God, it's 2.30, I'm old. And, and then you know, Lance says something, what'd you say? And I'm, and I'm sitting there cracking up and I'm just listening to these amazing stories and just being part of the situation has been, I'm just so grateful to actually have been there and hanging out with these guys have just, it's been great. I was still living at home when I started sponsoring these guys and they would come to my parents' house and stayed at my parents' house and my mom is in the audience tonight. She's 86, mom, where are you? Yeah, she's back there. So she knew these guys when they were literally 13 years old and Rodney, the story is, is when Rodney came to my house the first time, he thought he was going to have to go home and quit skateboarding and he stole a spoon from my mom because he wanted it as a memory and he told her tonight she demanded it back. <laughs> so Rodney, where's the spoon? <laughs> it's in a safe place. <laughs> So Craig, it's great to see you kind of get a real public uh, uh, acknowledgement for your contribution as well. Thank you. We want to hear you talk about uh, what it was like to work with these guys. A pleasure. <laughs> Actually, yeah, my father figure was Tommy here. <laughs> He's taken care of me for years. I do my best. And it's also a great, George, to see you down there at the end, too, and have you on stage here. It's so great. I would like to say one thing. that When we were together at Sundance, we realized how lucky we were as a group that we were able to meet and have this experience together. And something that I discussed with Rodney is they were very lucky to be born at this time because when they came into skateboarding, it was a very blank canvas still. My generation faced a terribly blank canvas, but this generation faced one as well. And these guys, as a result of that, stepped up to the plate and really invented some of the most important maneuvers. So we all feel very lucky that we live this experience, but we all feel very lucky that we got to do it together. And we're just, this is just one of the stories in skateboarding. There are many, many more, but we, um, this is ours and it's time for other people to do theirs. As much of an honor as Sundance was, and it was cool, it was all those things, it was like, wow, this is the real thing. But man, coming back here, you talk about the generations, there's people in the audience, these are my heroes. And to have you guys all here at once, this is the best of all the experiences we've had. Thank you. 
the reason Tony Hawk is not here is because we voted him off. <laughs> Actually, Tony's in Australia. He made a deal about a year ago to be in Australia. He couldn't be here, and he really wanted to be here with us, so that's why he's not part of this right now. But thank you all very much. People, they only see the outcome, but they don't know what really goes into it. The guys used to spit on Tony back in the day. It was so discouraging that I was gonna quit. How in the world could this guy be the world champion and just walk away from it? My dad, you know, he never wanted me to skate. And he goes, you're going nowhere in life and I'm doing this to save you. I was miserable at everything I tried to do. I rode a bike, tried to do a wheelie, the front wheel fell off, I crashed. Skateboarding, it was the first time I was good at something. <laughs> Not only were they unknown, they were all picked as a very young crew. When we got into skating, you did not become rich or famous if you were good at skateboarding. No one did, no matter how good you were. I just remember looking at my arms and the goosebumps, and I, just, I just witnessed history. It was the moment where skateboarding became skateboarding. Hawk just got bigger and bigger every time I came out of jail. I was pushing a shopping cart, Hawk was on a Slurpee cup. I'm here in representation of thousands of other kids who worship those guys as well and whose lives that those guys changed. When I started skating, it gave me a sense of identity, it gave me a sense of self-confidence, it, it gave me a purpose. Teachers would reach out, is he autistic or I, I don't know. Skateboarding, what it represented, the ability to create, to express myself, it became my voice. I just look back at my life and I feel so blessed. 
to be a part of this whole scene. <laughs>